Written and read by John C. Maxwell. Hi, this is John Maxwell. Throughout my life, I've looked for answers to the question, why are some people successful and others not? Let me tell you a story that I believe reveals the solution. A friend of mine has two daughters. Kim, the 21-year-old daughter, applied to pharmacy school during her senior year of college. On the day that she got word that she was accepted, her older sister, Jenny, was there to share the news. Jenny was glad that Kim had achieved her goal, but she pitied her at the same time. Mom, she said, I feel sorry for Kim. She's going to have to go to school for four more years. Successful people think differently than unsuccessful people. One sister heard the news and was excited because she thought about the lucrative, rewarding career that was going to open up to her after graduate school. The other sister thought only about the amount of time it would take to achieve it. If you're currently not successful, or you are not as successful as you would like to be, it may be because you are not thinking your way to the top. To place yourself on the pathway of success, I suggest that you do the following. Listen to each chapter to better understand successful thinking. Evaluate yourself at the end of each chapter by answering the thinking question. Take the steps included to implement the kind of successful thinking contained in the chapter. Together for the next 14 chapters, we will take a thinking trip. It could be the difference that makes all the difference in your life. Part 1. Change your thinking and change your life. Chapter 1. Understand the value of good thinking. What is the one thing successful people have in common? What is the one thing that separates those who go to the top from those who never seem to get there? The answer? Good thinking. Those who embrace good thinking as a lifestyle understand the relationship between their level of thinking and their level of progress. In the first book I wrote back in 1979 entitled Think on These Things, I said, your life today is a result of your thinking yesterday. Your life tomorrow will be determined by what you think today. The title of that book was inspired by the words of the Apostle Paul who admonished, Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Those words were often quoted to me by my father, Melvin Maxwell. They were important to him because he is an example of someone who changed his thinking and therefore changed his life. If you met my dad, he would tell you that he was born with a naturally negative bent to his thinking. In addition, he grew up during the Depression, and when he was six years old, his mother died. But as a teenager, he began to see that all the successful people he knew had one thing in common. Their lives were filled with positive thoughts about themselves and others. He desired to be successful like them, so he embarked on the daily task of changing his thinking. He became a college president and touched the lives of innumerable people. To this day, he is my hero. Changing from negative to positive thinking isn't always easy, especially if you're someone who has a difficult time with change. For some people, it's a lifelong struggle. When it comes to making positive personal changes, do you know what most people's number one challenge is? It's their feelings. They want to change, but they don't know how to get past their emotions. But there is a way to do it. Take a look at the truth contained in the following syllogism. Major premise. I can control my thoughts. Minor premise. My feelings come from my thoughts. Conclusion. I can control my feelings by controlling my thoughts. If you are willing to change your thinking, you can change your feelings. If you can change your feelings, you can change your actions. And changing your actions based on good thinking can change your life. Becoming a better thinker is worth your effort because the way you think really impacts every aspect of your life. It doesn't matter whether you are a business person, teacher, parent, scientist, pastor, or corporate executive. Good thinking will make you a better business person, teacher, parent, scientist, pastor, or corporate executive. Good thinking creates the foundation for good results. If you don't like the crop you're reaping, you need to change the seed you're sowing. When it comes to achievement, 
The seed is your thinking. Good thinking increases your potential. If your thinking shapes who you are, then it naturally follows that your potential is determined by your thinking. Achieving your potential comes from making progress, and progress is often just a good idea away. That was certainly true of Sam Walton, the founder of Walmart. He explained, I guess in all my years what I heard more often than anything was, a town of less than 50,000 people in population cannot support a discount store for very long. But Walton did not think the way his competitors thought, and for that reason, his potential was greater. Today, Walmart is the world's largest retailer, employing more than one million people and achieving annual sales in excess of $191 billion. Every week, more than 100 million customers visit Walmart stores. For many people, the greatest detriment to their success tomorrow is their thinking today. If their thinking is limited, so is their potential. But if people can keep growing in their thinking, they will constantly outgrow what they're doing. Good thinking produces more good thinking if you make it a habit. Albert Einstein observed, The solutions to the problems we face today cannot be solved on the same level of thinking we were at when we created them. Look around you, and you'll see that it is true. The world keeps getting more and more complicated. The good news is that no matter how complicated life gets or how difficult problems may seem, good thinking can make a difference if you make it a consistent part of your life. The more you engage in good thinking, the more good thoughts you will continue to think. I believe that good thinking isn't just one thing. It consists of several specific thinking skills. Becoming a good thinker means developing those skills to the best of your ability. In Built to Last, Jim Collins describes what it means to be a visionary company. He describes these companies this way. A visionary company is like a great work of art. Think of Michelangelo's scenes from Genesis on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel or a statue of David. Think of a great and enduring novel like Huckleberry Finn or Crime and Punishment. Think of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Think of a beautifully designed building like the masterpieces of Frank Lloyd Wright. You can't point to any one single item that makes the whole thing work. It's the entire work, all the pieces working together to create an overall effect that leads to enduring greatness. Good thinking is similar. You need all the thinking pieces to become the kind of person who can achieve great things. Those pieces include the following 11 skills. Seeing the wisdom of big picture thinking. Unleashing the potential of focused thinking. Discovering the joy of creative thinking. Recognizing the importance of realistic thinking. Releasing the power of strategic thinking feeling the energy of possibility thinking, embracing the lessons of reflective thinking, questioning the acceptance of popular thinking, encouraging the participation of shared thinking, experiencing the satisfaction of unselfish thinking, and enjoying the return of bottom line thinking. As you become acquainted with each skill, you will discover that you do some well and others you don't. Learn to develop each of these kinds of thinking, and you will become a better thinker. Master all that you can, and your life will change. Gabe Lyons, an Enjoy Vice President, recently attended an event at the Fox Theater in downtown Atlanta and came back completely on fire with enthusiasm. The speaker for the occasion was Jack Welch, former CEO of General Electric. Jack Welch came to promote his book, Jack, Straight from the Gut, but he didn't read from the book or give a canned lecture. He did something much more valuable for his audience. He answered their questions. Gabe said, A young guy asked, When you were my age, what did you do that elevated yourself among all of your other associates? How did you stand out in the crowd of all of the other young, ambitious, and driven colleagues of your day? Jack responded, The first thing you must understand is the importance of getting out of the pile. The only way you are going to stand out to your boss is to understand this simple principle. When your boss asks you a question, assigns a basic project, or sends you out to gather some data, you must understand that your boss already knows the answer that he's looking for. As a matter of fact, 
In most cases, he simply wants you to go out and confirm what he already believes is true in his gut. Most people simply go out and do just that, Jack continued, confirm what their boss believes to be true. But here is the difference maker. You must understand that the question is only the beginning. When your boss asks you a question, that question should become the jumping off point for several more ideas and thoughts. If you want to elevate yourself, you must sink your thoughts and time into not only answering the question, but going above and beyond it to add value to the train of thought your boss was on. Practically speaking, that means coming back to the table and presenting to your boss not only an answer, but three or more other ideas, options, and perspectives that were probably not previously considered by your boss. The goal is to add value to the idea and the thought by exceeding expectations when the question is given to you. This is true not only with questions, but assignments, initiatives, and everything else ever given to you to run with by upper management. Ask yourself this thinking question. Do I believe that good thinking can change my life? Take the next step toward understanding good thinking. Who are the best thinkers you know? Name them. What separates them from the rest of the crowd? Describe what's different about them. Choose one of those thinkers and try to arrange to spend some time with him or her. Who you associate with matters. In the past, how would you have defined good thinking? How would you describe it now? What personal or professional issues have created ongoing obstacles to your progress? Don't try to solve them now. Simply describe them on a piece of paper or at your computer. Chapter 2 Realize the Impact of Changed Thinking It's easy to believe that unsuccessful people need to change their thinking, but how about people who have already achieved a degree of success? Can individuals go to the next level without changing the way they think? Karen Ford didn't set out in life to be a business person or an entrepreneur. She started out as a teacher. For ten years she taught second grade and she was a good teacher. But when her second child was born, he was diagnosed with a heart condition that required him to receive medication every four hours, every day, for a year. So Karen left her job and stayed home to take care of her son. That put her family in a bit of a financial bind. That's when she decided to try selling Mary Kay cosmetics. It appealed to her because she could earn $50 a week to make up for her lost teaching income. She made plans to do that for a year, and then, when her son was well, she would return to her career in teaching. But she found out that she really enjoyed working with Mary Kay, and she was really good at it. I was making more income than I ever thought possible in my life, she says. I was being awarded diamonds, trips, cars. She never returned to the classroom. For the next couple of years, Karen worked hard selling products, recruiting like-minded women, and building her own organization. At Mary Kay, each woman is an independent business person. The company, which now has over 750,000 beauty consultants working with it, has this philosophy. In business for yourself, but not by yourself. Karen's success soon made her part of an exclusive group. She was one of 8,200 independent sales directors. But she believed she was capable of going to the highest level in Mary Kay. She wanted to become a national sales director. For the next five years, Karen worked tirelessly to achieve her goal. She recruited people. She increased her sales from half a million dollars a year to over 650000 She felt that she had done everything needed to make it to the highest level. But when the call finally came from Mary Kay in 1995, it was to tell her that she had not been appointed a national sales director. Karen was told that the main reason she hadn't made it was that she had gathered a bunch of followers who were simply trying to carry out her dreams and goals, not leaders who could achieve on their own and rally others to succeed. Karen was ready to quit Mary Kay. She attempted multiple times to write her letter of resignation, but she just couldn't do it. She kept thinking about the people in her organization and the hopes and the dreams they had. She didn't want to change her goal. Instead, she determined to change herself. She went on a personal growth binge, devouring every leadership book and tape she could get her hands on. She made it her goal to learn how to lead leaders. When she reemerged and began to work with her people again, 
She started creating strategies and systems that would help her people to grow as she had. And she determined to become the best business person she could at her current level. Because Karen changed herself from the inside out, she began attracting different kinds of people. People who could think and lead as she did. And she took them to new levels of achievement. On October 1st, 1998, she received another phone call from Mary Kay headquarters. This time, she was informed that she had accomplished what only 170 other Mary Kay consultants around the world had done. She had been made a national sales director. It's hard to overstate the value of changing your thinking. Good thinking can do many things for you. Generate revenue, solve problems, and create opportunities. It can take you to a whole new level, personally and professionally. It really can change your life. Here are some things you need to know about changing your thinking. Changed thinking is not automatic. The unhappy truth is that a change in thinking doesn't happen on its own. Good ideas rarely go out and find the person. If you want to become a better thinker, you need to work at it. But the good news is that once you begin to become a better thinker, the good ideas keep coming. Changed thinking is difficult. The only people who believe thinking is easy are those who aren't in the habit of engaging in it. Nobel Prize winning physicist Albert Einstein, one of the best thinkers who ever lived, asserted, thinking is hard work. That's why so few do it. Change thinking is worth the investment. When you take the time to learn how to change your thinking and become a better thinker, you are investing in yourself. A human mind with the ability to think well is like a diamond mind that never runs out. Changed thinking is the best gift that you can give others. While learning to think better is a great investment in yourself, teaching someone else to think better is the greatest present you can give them because it represents the gift of unlimited potential. Most people who are not content with their lives don't know the reason why. Often they suspect that circumstances or other people are to blame. Those who are more honest and self-aware know that the problem lies inside of them, yet they still have trouble getting to the root of the issue. They desire to change, but they don't do anything differently so that they can change. The truth is that only when you make the right changes to your thinking do other things begin to turn out right in your life. The process of changing your life begins when you take responsibility to change your thinking. Follow the process faithfully, and it will result in your experiencing a changed life. Here's how it works. Step 1. Changing your thinking changes your beliefs. As you strive to change your thinking, tell yourself these three things. Change is personal. I need to change. Change is possible. I'm able to change. Change is profitable. I'll be rewarded by change. Step 2. Changing your beliefs changes your expectations. A belief is not just an idea that you possess. It's an idea that possesses you. There is a great power in belief because it changes an individual's expectations. When Karen Ford changed her thinking and built her beliefs on a new foundation of growth, she had more than just hope and a dream to carry her forward. She expected to achieve her goal because she had done the hard work of changing to prepare for it. Step 3. Changing your expectations changes your attitude. Our expectations have a tremendous impact on our attitudes. Negative expectations are a quick route to dead-end thinking. Positive expectations bring a positive attitude. They produce excitement, conviction, desire, confidence, commitment, and energy, all characteristics that help a person to achieve success. If you would like to possess these qualities in greater abundance, then the way to do it is to raise your expectations. Step 4. Changing your attitude changes your behavior. Have you ever observed how your mood affects the way you act? When you are feeling particularly happy, are you more energized? Are you more likely to be kind to others? Do you take on tasks more readily and complete them with confidence and competence? How about when you're having a really bad day? Do you get less work done? Are you less patient with your family and colleagues? Does everything seem like a chore? An attitude is little more than a mood or predominant emotion sustained over time. 
Your behavior is always impacted by your attitude. The two cannot be separated from one another. Step 5. Changing your behavior changes your performance. When I was in my 20s, I decided I wanted to become a better golfer. I went to see a golf professional to get some advice on how to improve. You're using a baseball grip, the pro told me. You're never going to improve until you change it. Then he showed me the proper way to hold the golf club. I don't know if I'll ever be able to do it this way, I complained. It's up to you, he answered. You can do it the old way, but you'll never get any better. My performance would depend on a change in behavior. I made the change. Reaching new goals and moving to a higher level of performance always requires change, and change is awkward. However, take comfort in the knowledge that if a change doesn't feel uncomfortable, then it's probably not really a change. Step 6. Changing your performance changes your life. When you change your performance, that is, what you're able to do on a consistent basis, then you have the power to change your life. Although I write a lot of books, my primary career is in communication. Each year I speak in person to more than 350,000 people. Now, if you had heard me speak three and a half decades ago when I started my career, you never would have expected me to achieve such success. Let's just say I was less than inspiring. But my desire was to reach my potential. I was determined to improve. To get the end result of changing my performance, I started the process of growth by changing my thinking. I knew that I could not approach communication in the same way mentally and perform differently. I began by studying speakers who were respected in my limited circle of experience and watching what they did. I tried to figure out what they were doing. Then I copied them. The next thing I did was take a more intellectual route to communication. I used research, stats, and etymology. In the process, I learned a little more, particularly when it came to preparation and writing. With those skills under my belt, I began studying people who were on a level of skill beyond anyone in my circle. I saw how they connected with an audience, and I began trying to do the same. I realized that people learned better when there was some kind of a hook. I saw how people responded to humor and incorporated the kind of humor that I was good at. It took me eight years to learn how to be myself before an audience and to develop my own style. Progress always requires change. Going to a new level always requires changing your mind. I know that you know that intuitively, but you need to make that idea a foundation to the way that you live your life. Martin Grunder tells a story about Mark Victor Hansen, the motivational speaker who created the chicken soup for the soul empire. Years ago, before his great success, Hansen approached Tony Robbins at an event where both of them were speaking, and he said, Tony, I've been doing this for a long time, and I'm doing okay. I'm making about a million dollars a year doing what I'm doing. I know for a fact that you made $156 million last year with your speaking and teaching and all of your products. How do you do it? How can I do it? Grunder says Robbins turned to Hansen and asked, Who is in your mastermind group? That's a group of like-minded people someone meets with to generate ideas and have accountability. Millionaires, replied Hansen. We're all millionaires. That's what you're doing wrong, Robbins remarked. You need to find yourself some billionaires and begin associating with them. They'll get you thinking at their level. To say that Hansen has gone to another level since that conversation is stating it mildly. His goal is to sell one billion chicken soup books, and he is well on his way to accomplishing that. Do you want to succeed where you have failed before? Do you want to go to a level you never even dreamed possible? If you do, don't start by trying to change your actions. Start by changing your mind. Nothing else you can do will have as great an impact thinking question is my desire for success and to improve my life strong enough to prompt me to change my thinking measuring the impact of change thinking when Karen Ford faced obstacles in her path to the next level and failed she was tempted to quit how have you handled similar situations list several major disappointments you have faced in your career or personal life and how you responded now ask yourself, when you have tried to improve your life in the past, where have you focused your energy? Write down the following six words. Thinking, beliefs, 
expectations, attitude, behavior, and performance. Using that list, rank where you ordinarily place the most emphasis by marking it with a 1. Mark the next most important area with a 2 and proceed until you've ranked all six in order. Based on your answers, how much will you have to change the way you naturally want to do things in order to change your thinking as outlined in the chapter? Explain. And finally, I believe that success is okay as long as it's seen as growth, not an end in itself. Could your past successes be getting in the way of your future success? Think about an area where you have been successful in the past but have currently plateaued. Figure out what is lacking in your current performance and trace back through performance, behavior, attitude, expectations, and beliefs until you go back to the source, thinking. How must you change your thinking to break through to the next level? Chapter 3. Master the Process of Intentional Thinking Becoming a good thinker isn't overly complicated. Simply stated, it's a discipline. And like most disciplines, it can be cultivated and refined. That's why I want to teach you the process that I've used to discover and develop good thoughts. It's certainly not the only one that works, but it has certainly worked well for me. Number one, find a place to think your thoughts. If you go to a place to think and you expect to generate good thoughts there, then eventually you will come up with some good thoughts. Everybody is different when it comes to where to think. Some people think best in the shower. Others, like my friend Dick Biggs, like to go to a park. For me, the best places to think are in my car, on planes, or in my spa. Find a place where you can think and plan to capture your thoughts on paper so that you don't lose them. Number two, shape your thoughts. Rarely do ideas come fully formed and completely worked out. Most of the time, they need to be shaped until they have substance. During the shaping time, you want to hold an idea up to strong scrutiny. Many times, a thought that seemed outstanding late at night looks pretty silly in the light of day. Ask questions about your ideas. Fine-tune them. One of the best ways to do that is to put your thoughts in writing. As you shape your thoughts, you really find out whether an idea has potential or not. By asking questions, you gain perspective on your ideas. Number three. Stretch your thoughts. If you come upon great thoughts and spend time mentally shaping them, don't think you're done and can stop there. If you do, you will miss some of the most valuable aspects of the whole thinking process. You miss bringing others in and expanding ideas to their greatest potential. If you really want to take an idea to the highest level, ask others to help you. I found that there's a kind of formula that can help you stretch your thoughts. It says, the right thought plus the right people in the right environment at the right time for the right reason equals the right result. It's a combination that's hard to beat. Here's why. The right thought. Everything begins with the seed of an idea. The right people. When you expose an idea to the right people, incredible things can happen to that idea. The original thought often grows along with its vision, power, and impact. Who are the right people to stretch a vision? They are the ones who love you and embrace your vision, know you and strengthen your vision, and compliment you and enlarge your vision. The right environment. A right environment is one where thinking is valued, ideas flow freely, fresh eyes are welcomed, change is expected, questions are encouraged, egos are checked, ideas stimulate better ideas, and thinking generates teamwork. If you are in a wrong environment, then you need to find one that encourages you. If you're a leader, you need to realize that you are creating the environment that you are in. The right time. Ideas are fragile things when they first see the light of day. If you try to implement them too early or introduce them while there are more naysayers than supporters, they won't survive. When you are still in the stretching stage of an idea, present it without time frames or rigidly defined goals. Thoughts must be allowed to breathe before you harness them. The right reason. J.P. Morgan said a man always has two reasons for doing anything, a good reason and the real reason. Motives matter. 
If your ideas are motivated by adding value to others rather than just yourself, people will be more inclined to help you stretch them. Sometimes a thought is only a springboard to a greater idea, but without that springboard, the great idea would never be found. Sometimes a thought becomes great when it is partnered with another great idea. And sometimes a thought is remarkable just as it is and only needs to be fleshed out. Finding a place to stretch your thoughts gives you a chance to take that idea as far as it can go. Number four, land your thoughts. Any idea that remains only an idea doesn't make a great impact. The truth is that the real power of an idea comes when it goes from abstraction to application. If you want your thoughts to make an impact, you need to land them with others first so that they can someday be implemented. As you plan for the application phase of the thinking process, land your ideas first with yourself. Landing an idea with yourself will give you integrity. People will buy into an idea only after they buy into the leader who communicates it. That won't happen if the leader doesn't believe in it himself. Land your idea with key players. Let's face it, no idea will fly if it isn't embraced by the influencers. Landing an idea with the influencers in your organization, for example, will increase your influence. After all, they are the people who carry thoughts from idea to implementation. And then, land your idea with those most affected. Landing thoughts with the people on the firing line will give you great insight. Those closest to changes that occur as a result of a new idea are able to give you a reality read. And that's important. Because sometimes, even when you've diligently gone through the process of creating a thought, shaping it, and stretching it with other good thinkers, you can still miss the mark. Number five, fly your thoughts. What good is thinking if it ultimately has no application in real life? If your thinking is totally separate from your actions, then it's not productive. And that's the value of learning how to master the process of thinking well. It leads you to productive thinking. If you are able to develop the discipline of good thinking and turn it into a lifetime habit, then you will be productive all of your life. Once you've created, shaped, stretched, and landed your thoughts, then flying them can be fun and easy. Give your plans the right amount of thinking time, and you'll find that the implementation time decreases and the results get better. Your thinking time is like the runway of an airport. Just as the larger planes need a longer runway to fly, big ideas need a long runway of thinking to be launched. In every chapter, I will give you a practical way to approach the kind of thinking explained in that chapter. For this chapter on mastering the process of good thinking, I recommend the following six steps. Number one, expose yourself to good input. Good thinkers are always looking for things to get the thinking process started. However, what you put in always impacts what comes out. I recommend that you read books, review trade magazines, listen to tapes, and spend time with good thinkers. And when something intrigues you, whether it's someone else's idea that you discovered or a seed of an idea that you've come up with, keep it in front of you. Put it somewhere in your favorite thinking place to stimulate your thinking. Number two, expose yourself to good thinkers. Another way to gain good input is by spending time with the right people. All of the people in my life whom I consider to be close friends or colleagues are thinkers. They are constantly trying to grow and learn. The writer of Proverbs observed that sharp people sharpen one another, just as iron sharpens iron. If you want to be a sharp thinker, get around sharp people. Number three, choose to think good thoughts. To become a good thinker, you must become intentional about your thinking process. Regularly put yourself in the right place to think, shape, stretch, and land your thoughts. Make it a priority. Remember, thinking is a discipline. Recently, I had breakfast with Dan Cathy, the president of Chick-fil-A, a fast food chain with its headquarters in the Atlanta area. I asked him if he made thinking time a high priority in his life. Not only did he say yes, but he told me about what he calls his thinking schedule. It helps him to fight the hectic pace of life that discourages intentional thinking. Dan says he sets aside time just to think for a half a day 
every two weeks, for one whole day every month, and for two or three full days every year. Dan explains, this helps me to keep the main thing the main thing since I am so easily distracted. You may want to do something similar to what Dan does, or you can develop a schedule or method of your own. No matter what you choose to do, go to your thinking place, take paper and pen, and make sure you capture your ideas in writing. Number four, act on your good thoughts. Ideas have a short shelf life. You must act on them before the expiration date. The ultimate goal of thinking is application. World War I flying ace Eddie Rickenbacker said, I can give you a six-word formula for success. Think things through, then follow through. Number five, allow your emotions to create another good thought. When I was a pastor, I counseled many people. In that process, I discovered that for some people, the greatest challenge to becoming a good thinker is their emotional turmoil or baggage. Past hurts or current worries prevent them from spending productive time thinking. To start the thinking process, you cannot rely on your feelings. If you wait until you feel like doing something, you will likely never accomplish it. The same is true for thinking. You cannot wait until you feel like thinking to do it. However, I found that once you engage in the process of good thinking, you can use your emotions to feed the process and create mental momentum. Try it for yourself. After you go through the disciplined process of thinking and experience some success, allow yourself to enjoy the moment and try riding the mental energy of that success. If you're like me, it's likely to spur additional thoughts and productive ideas. And number six, repeat the process. One good thought does not make a good life. The people who have one good thought and try to write it for an entire career often end up unhappy or destitute. They are the one-hit wonders, the one-book authors, the one-message speakers, the one-time inventors who spend their life struggling to protect or promote their single idea. Success comes to those who have an entire mountain of gold that they continually mine, not those who find one nugget and try to live on it for 50 years. To become someone who can mine a lot of gold, you need to keep repeating the process of good thinking. It doesn't matter whether you were born rich or poor. It doesn't matter if you have a third grade education or possess a PhD. It doesn't matter if you suffer from multiple disabilities or you're the picture of health. No matter what your circumstances, you can learn to be a good thinker. All you have to do is to be willing to engage in the process every day. Here's a thinking question for you. Am I willing to pay the price to cultivate the habit of giving birth to, nurturing, and developing great thoughts every day? Here's how you can put good thinking into action. Number one, if you don't already have a good thinking place, you need to find one. Where will you choose to create your thoughts? Number two, who are the good thinkers in your life? List them. Number three, what are you currently working on that could benefit from some think time? You may want to address the issue you identified at the end of chapter one. Take some time to write down the problem. Number four, spend some time thinking about that issue. Then get together the good thinkers in your life to help you stretch and then land your thoughts. Number five, what good input are you regularly exposing yourself to? Do you have a plan for growth? What magazines, journals, or tape services do you subscribe to just to challenge yourself as a thinker? If you don't already do that, then begin immediately. Choose three to five resources that you can begin using to improve yourself. Part 2, 11 Thinking Skills Every Successful Person Needs. Chapter 4. Acquire the Wisdom of Big Picture Thinking If someone told you that on the longest day of the year, you would be able to look deep into an old-fashioned well that was located in a certain town and see the sun reflected in the water, what would you think? An Egyptian librarian heard that bit of information, that the sun could be seen shining at the bottom of a well in the town of Syene, and it was more than just trivia to him. He surmised that if it made a reflection in a well, 
the sun must be directly overhead. And if it were directly overhead, then it would cast no shadows from upright columns or posts. Yet on the longest day of the year in the city of Alexandria, where he lived, he observed that straight columns did cast shadows. He decided to travel the 800 kilometers to Syene to verify that what he had heard was true. On the longest day of the year, he looked into the well and saw the sun reflected. And sure enough, at midday, posts cast no shadows. He began to see a bigger picture of what these seemingly insignificant facts meant. Surprisingly, it went against what nearly everyone believed at the time. You see, the librarian's name was Eratosthenes, and he lived more than 2,200 years ago. As the director of the greatest library in the world, the Library of Alexandria in Egypt was said to possess hundreds of thousands of scrolls, he was at the intellectual capital of the world for his time. In the third century B.C., nearly every scholar in Alexandria and around the world believed that the earth was flat. But Eratosthenes reasoned that if the sun's light came down straight and the earth was flat, then there would be no shadows in both locations. If there were shadows in one location but not the other, then there could be only one logical explanation. The surface of the earth must be curved. That's a pretty impressive mental leap, although it seems perfectly logical to us today. But Eratosthenes made the big picture connection by using everyday facts and putting them together. What's even more impressive is that he actually calculated the size of the earth. Using basic trigonometry, he measured the angle of the shadows and calculated that it was approximately 7.12 degrees. That's about one-fiftieth of a circle. And he reasoned that if the distance between Syene and Alexandria was 800 kilometers, then the Earth must be around 40,000 kilometers in circumference. He wasn't far off. The actual circumference of the Earth through the poles is 40,008 kilometers. You don't have to be a scientist or a mathematician to embrace big picture thinking or to benefit from it. It can help any person in any profession. Spend time with big picture thinkers and you will discover the following. Big picture thinkers learn continually. Big picture thinkers are never satisfied with what they already know. They are always visiting new places, reading new books, meeting new people, learning new skills. And because of that practice, they are often able to connect the unconnected just as Eratosthenes did. They are lifelong learners. One of the things that I do to help me to maintain a learner's attitude is spend a few moments every morning thinking about my learning opportunities for the day. As I review my calendar and to-do list, knowing who I will meet that day, what I will read, which meetings I will attend, I note where I am most likely to learn something, and I mentally cue myself to look attentively for something that will improve me. If you desire to keep learning, I want to encourage you to examine your day and look for opportunities to learn. Big picture thinkers listen intentionally. One of the best ways to broaden my experience is to listen to someone who has expertise in an area where I don't. When you meet with people, it's good to have an agenda so that you can learn. It's a great way to partner with people who can do things you can't. Big picture thinkers understand that there are lots of things they do not know. They frequently ask penetrating questions to enlarge their thinking and understanding. If you want to become a better big-picture thinker, then become a good listener. Big-picture thinkers look expansively. Human beings are in the habit of seeing their own world first. Big-picture thinkers realize there is a world out there besides their own, and they make an effort to get outside of themselves and see other people's worlds through their eyes. To see how others see, you must first find out how they think. Becoming a good listener certainly helps with that. So does getting over your personal agenda and trying to take the other person's perspective. Big picture thinkers live completely. Becoming a big picture thinker can help you to live with wholeness, to live a very fulfilling life. People who see the big picture expand their experience because they expand their world. As a result, they are able to accomplish more than narrow-minded people and they experience fewer unwanted surprises, too, because in any given situation, 
they are more likely to see the many components involved issues people relationships timing and values they are also therefore usually more tolerant of other people in their thinking intuitively you probably know that big picture thinking is beneficial after all few people want to be close-minded no one sets out to be that way but just in case you're not completely convinced here are several specific reasons why you should make the effort to become a better thinker when it comes to the big picture number one big picture thinking allows you to lead a few years ago in leadership journal Lynn Anderson described an incident from American history as an illustration of limited thinking more than three centuries ago the pilgrims landed on the shores of the American continent with great courage and vision in their first year a small group of settlers established a town the next year they elected a town council in their third year that council proposed building a road five miles into the wilderness for westward expansion but the following year the people criticized the proposal as a waste of public funds evidently they couldn't see the big picture as Anderson pointed out the pilgrims had once been able to see across the oceans they now could not look five miles into the wilderness you can find many big-picture thinkers who aren't leaders but you will find few leaders who are not big-picture thinkers leaders must be able to see the vision before their people do in fact leaders not only see the big picture before others do they also see more of it this allows them to size up situations taking into account many variables leaders who see the big picture discern potential possibilities as well as problems as Max Dupree says the first responsibility of leaders is to define reality doing that allows them to form a foundation to build the vision once they have done that leaders can sketch a picture of where the team is going too often when people present the big picture it is drawn up as a bright image without any challenges or obstacles that false portrait only leads to discouragement when people actually take the journey the goal of leaders shouldn't be to merely make their people feel good but to help them be good and accomplish the dream the vision shown accurately will allow leaders to show how the future connects with the past to make the journey more meaningful most people want to touch their past before they are willing to reach out to their future when they can do that moving forward seems natural and right when leaders recognize this need for connection and bridge it then they can seize the moment when the timing is right in leadership when to move is as important as what you do number two big picture thinking keeps you on target to get things done you need focus however to get the right things done you need also to consider the big picture only by putting your daily activities in the context of the big picture will you be able to stay on target number three big picture thinking allows you to see what others see in human relations one of the most important skills you can develop is the ability to see things from the other person's point of view it's one of the keys to working with clients satisfying customers maintaining a marriage raising children helping those who are less fortunate etc all interactions with people are enhanced by the ability to put yourself in another person's shoes how do you get outside of yourself and look at things from another perspective you look beyond yourself your own interest and your own world you look at the big picture when you work to consider an issue from every possible angle examine it in the light of other people's history discover other people's interests and concerns and try to set your own agenda you begin to see what others see and that is a powerful thing when it comes to working with people number four big-picture thinking promotes teamwork if you participate in any kind of team activity then you know how important it is that team members see the whole picture not just their own part any time a person doesn't know how his work fits with that of his teammates then the whole team is in trouble the better the grasp team members have of the big picture the greater their potential to work together as a team number five big picture thinking keeps you from being caught up in the mundane let's face it 
There are aspects of everyday life that are absolutely necessary but thoroughly disinteresting. Big picture thinkers don't let the grind get to them because they don't lose sight of the all-important overview. They know that the person who forgets the ultimate is a slave to the immediate. I begin each day with a big picture mindset. To accomplish this, I look at my written agenda for the day. It allows me to see the whole day at a glance. Out of my schedule, I pick out the main event. This is the one event that is most important for me to do well, the thing that will make or break my day. In preparation for the day, I focus on that main event and ask myself, in order to make the main event a good event, what must I know? What must I do? What must I see? And what must I eliminate? Once I answer these questions, I am able to approach my day with a big picture perspective. Some things will be fun, some things won't. But with preparation, the most important thing will be done well. Number six, big picture thinking helps you to chart uncharted territory. Have you ever heard the expression, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it? That phrase was undoubtedly coined by someone who had trouble seeing the big picture. The only way to break new ground or move into uncharted territory is to look beyond the immediate and see the big picture. If your desire is to seize new opportunities and open new horizons, then you need to add big picture thinking to your abilities. To become a good thinker who is better able to see the big picture, keep in mind the following suggestions. Don't strive for certainty. One of the hallmarks of big picture thinkers is that they are comfortable with ambiguity. They don't try to force every observation or piece of data into pre-formulated mental cubbyholes. Their thinking is broad and they can juggle a lot of seemingly contradictory thoughts in their minds. Learn from every experience. Big picture thinkers broaden their outlook by striving to learn from every experience. They don't rest on their successes, they learn from them. More importantly, they learn from their failures. They are able to do that because they remain teachable. In my book, Failing Forward, I described the teachable spirit this way. Teachability is an attitude, a mindset that says no matter how much I know or think I know, I can learn from this situation. That kind of thinking can help you turn adversity into advantage. It can make you a winner even during the most difficult circumstances. If you desire to be a big picture thinker, then get out there and try a lot of things. Take a lot of chances and take time to learn after every victory or defeat. Gain insight from a variety of people. Big picture thinkers learn from their experiences. But they also learn a lot by receiving insight from other people, from customers, employees, colleagues, and leaders. If you desire to broaden your thinking and see more of the big picture, then you will need to seek out wise counselors to help you along the way. But be wise in who you ask for advice. Talk to people who know and care about you, know their field, and bring experience deeper and broader than your own. Give yourself permission to expand your world. If you want to be a big picture thinker, you're going to have to go against the flow of the world. Society wants to keep people in boxes. Most people are mentally married to the status quo. They want what was, not what can be. They seek safety and simple answers. To think big picture, you need to give yourself permission to go a different way, to break new ground, to find new worlds to conquer. And when your world does get bigger, you need to celebrate. Never forget, there's more out there in the world than what you've experienced. Putting big picture thinking into action. On a scale of one to 10, with one being narrow and 10 being expansive, how are you when it comes to big picture thinking? Do you see the whole picture or are you more likely to focus in on just one aspect? If your number is lower than eight, then you need to give yourself permission to expand your world and then tenaciously work at becoming a better big picture thinker. Pick a past problem or current project that you would like to use big picture thinking to improve. Then use the following two exercises to expand your thinking. 
First, find the opposites. What is the obvious solution for success concerning this issue? Write it down. Now, what is an opposite solution? Something that would resolve the issue but seems to contradict the first idea. Write it down. Okay, how can you make those seemingly contradictory ideas work together? Second, gain insight from others. Take that same issue, problem, or project to three to five people who can give you insight on it. Be sure to pick good people using the criteria in the chapter. They must know and care about you, know their field, and bring experience deeper and broader than your own. And before you meet with each of them, spend adequate time formulating the questions you want to ask. That process will help you clarify the issues, and it will show the people you meet with how much you respect their time. Finally, make learning from your experiences a regular part of your daily routine. Set aside a few minutes at the end of each day, or first thing the next morning, to review what you learn each day. Capture those thoughts in writing and file them so that you can retrieve and use them sometime in the future. Chapter 5. Unleash the Potential of Focus Thinking most people spend lots of time drawing and coloring with crayons when they were kids. Unless you were born under a rock, you are probably familiar with the name Crayola. It is the most popular and recognized brand in the world when it comes to crayons. Every year, Biney and Smith, the company that makes Crayola products, manufactures nearly 3 billion crayons at a rate of 12 million a day. The company was founded in 1864. Up to the turn of the century, the company's main products were items such as red pigments for barn paint and carbon black used in making lamp black or automobile tires. Their primary method of product development was simple. Ask their customers what their needs were and then develop products in the laboratory to meet those needs. In 1900, the company began making slate pencils for the educational market and they found that teachers were happy to tell company representatives what they desired. When teachers complained about poor chalk, Biney and Smith produced a superior dustless variety. When they complained that they couldn't buy a decent American crayon, the best were imported from Europe and very expensive, they developed the Crayola. The product was introduced to the market in 1903 as a box of eight colors that cost a nickel. Today they dominate that market, even in the face of the electronic revolution. In The Five Faces of Genius, Annette Moser Wellman assessed the company by saying, The biggest threat to Crayola's business has been the entry of computer games for kids. Instead of drawing and coloring, kids are tempted by interactive CDs and more. Instead of trying to dominate computer games, Crayola has chosen to flourish within their limitations. They do children's art products better than anyone. Biney and Smith could have lost focus in an attempt to chase new markets and diversify themselves. That's what toy manufacturer Coleco did. The company started out in leather goods in the 1950s and then switched to plastics. In the late 1960s, they were the world's largest manufacturer of above-ground swimming pools. They had found their niche. Yet in the 1970s and 80s, they chased after the computer game market and then low-end computers. You may remember ColecoVision. Then they tried to capitalize on Cabbage Patch dolls. It ultimately drove them into bankruptcy. It would have been easy for Biney and Smith to chase after other successes, but they didn't do that. The company has remained focused, and as long as it does, it will continue to excel and to sell more crayons and children's art supplies than any other company in the world. Just as focus is important to developing products for a company, it is also important for developing ideas for an individual. Focused thinking can do several things for you. Focused thinking harnesses energy toward a desired goal. Focus can bring energy and power to almost anything, whether it's physical or mental. If you're learning how to pitch a baseball and you want to develop a good curveball, then focused thinking while practicing will improve your technique. If you need to refine the manufacturing process of your product, focused thinking will help you develop the best method. If you want to solve a difficult mathematics problem, sustaining focus thinking helps you break through to the solution. That's why philosopher Bertrand Russell asserted, 
To be able to concentrate for a considerable time is essential to difficult achievement. The greater the difficulty of a problem or issue, the more focused thinking time will be necessary to solve it. Focused thinking gives ideas time to develop. I often bring my creative team together for brainstorming and creative thinking. When we first get together, we try to be exhaustive in our thinking in order to generate as many ideas as possible. That has great value because the birthing of a potential breakthrough is often the result of sharing a lot of good ideas. But to take ideas to the next level, you need to shift from being expansive in your thinking to being selective. Over the years, I have discovered that a good idea can become a great idea when it is given focused time. It's true that focusing on an idea for a long time can be very frustrating. I've often spent days focusing on a thought and trying to develop it only to find that I could not improve the idea. But sometimes my perseverance in focused thinking pays off. Focused thinking brings clarity to the target. Sociologist Robert Lind observed that knowledge is power only if a man knows what facts are not to bother about. Focused thinking removes distractions and mental clutter so that you can concentrate on an issue and think with clarity. That's crucial, because if you don't know what the target is, how will you ever hit it? Focused thinking will take you to the next level. No one achieves greatness by becoming a generalist. You don't hone a skill by diluting your attention to its development. The only way to get to the next level is to focus. No matter whether your goal is to increase your level of play, sharpen your business plan, improve your bottom line, develop your subordinates, or solve personal problems, you need to focus. Where should you focus your thinking? Does every area of your life deserve dedicated focused thinking time? Of course the answer is no. When it comes to focused thinking, it's better to be selective rather than exhaustive. For me, that means dedicating in-depth thinking time to four areas. Leadership, creativity, communication, and intentional networking. Your choices will probably be different. Here are a few suggestions to help you figure them out. Identify your priorities. The first thing you must take into account are your priorities for yourself, your family, and your team. There are many ways to determine priorities. If you know yourself well, then begin by focusing on your strengths, the things that make best use of your skills and God-given talents. Another way is to focus on what brings the highest return and reward. Do what you enjoy most and do best. You could use the 80-20 rule. Give 80% of your effort to the top 20% most important activities. Another way is to focus on exceptional opportunities that promise a huge return. The main thing is that you give your attention to the areas that bear fruit. Discover your gifts. Not all people are self-aware and have a good handle on their own skills, gifts, and talents. If you are someone with that kind of background, then you need to work extra hard now to figure out what your gifts are. Take a personality profile such as Disc or Myers-Briggs. Interview positive friends and family to see where they think you shine. Spend some time reflecting on past successes. If you're going to focus your thinking in your areas of strength, then you need to know what they are. Develop your dream. If you want to achieve great things, then you need to have a great dream. If you're not sure what your dream is, use your focused thinking time to help you to discover it. In the past, if your thinking has gone back to a particular area time after time, then you may be able to discover your dream there. Give it more focused time and see what happens. And once you find your dream, move forward without second guessing. The younger you are, the more likely you will give your attention to many things. That's good because you're still getting to know yourself, your strengths, and your weaknesses. After all, if you focus your thinking only on one thing and your aspirations change, then you've wasted your best mental energy. As you get older and more experienced, the need to focus becomes more critical. The farther and higher you go, the more focused you can be and need to be. Once you have a handle on what you should focus your thinking on, the next issue you must resolve is how to go about doing it. Here are five suggestions to help you with the process. Number one, remove distractions. Removing distractions is no small matter in our current culture, but it's critical because, as author and positive mental attitude advocate W. Clement Stone says, 
You can keep your mind off the things you don't want by keeping it on the things that you do want. How do you do it? First, by maintaining the discipline of practicing your priorities. Don't do easy things first, or hard things first, or urgent things first. Do first things first. The activities that give you the highest return. In that way, you can keep the distractions to a minimum. Another thing you can do is insulate yourself from distractions. I found that I need blocks of time to think without interruptions. I mastered the art of making myself unavailable from people and distractions when necessary and going off to my thinking place so that I can work without interruptions. Number two, make time for focus thinking. Once you have a place to think, then you need to have time to think. Because of the fast pace of our culture, people tend to multitask. But that's not always a good idea. Switching from task to task can lose you up to 40% efficiency. Number three, keep items of focus before you. To help me concentrate on the things that matter, I work to keep items that are important before me. I also keep items of focus before me in other ways. For example, if I'm working on a lesson for a conference or an outline for a book, I'll keep a file or a page on my desk so that I can see it every day as I work. That strategy has been successful for me for 30 years to stimulate and sharpen ideas. If you've never done it before, I recommend that you try it. Number four, set goals. As a kid growing up, I didn't have any goals. I just wanted to have a good time and play ball. It wasn't until college that I became more focused. It was good that I was finally becoming more intentional about my life, but when I look back at those goals today, <laughs> I laugh. The lifetime goals that I set were so small. If I had worked only until I achieved those goals, I would have fallen far short of where I am today. I believe goals are important, but the purpose of goals is to focus your attention and give you direction not to identify a final destination. As you think about your goals, note that they should be clear enough to be kept in focus, close enough to be achieved, and helpful enough to change lives. Those guidelines will get you going. And be sure to write down your goals. If they're not written, I can almost guarantee you that they're not focused enough. Number five, question your progress. Ask yourself, am I seeing a return from my investment of focused thinking time? Is what I'm doing getting me closer to my goals? Am I heading in a direction that is helping me to fulfill my commitments, maintain my priorities, and realize my dreams? Here's your thinking question for this chapter. Am I dedicated to removing distractions and mental clutter so that I can concentrate with clarity on the real issue? putting focused thinking into action. Rate yourself. On a scale of 1 to 10, with 1 being scattered and 10 being focused, how are you when it comes to being a focused thinker? The lower your number, the more time you need to carve out for focused thinking time. Now, go get your calendar and figure out how to schedule thinking time. Ideally, you should schedule some time daily as well as a good block of time once a week. Remember that to be effective, you must remove yourself from distractions, prevent unwanted interruptions, and be able to focus. Pick the best place and your most productive time of day for your focus thinking time. Then put it on your calendar and treat it as you would any important appointment. Our lives are most affected for good and bad by just a few events and decisions. Focus thinking can provide the arena to significantly impact those decisions and events. Determine which decisions currently on your plate are most important, and then schedule some of your thinking time during the week to address them. If you don't have goals, or your goals don't align with your dreams, then your focus time will be off track. Dedicate a large block of this week's thinking time to just thinking about and writing down your current goals. Chapter 6. Discover the Joy of Creative Thinking when I went off to college as an 18-year-old, one of my first classes was Psychology 101. The teacher wanted us to learn as much about ourselves as others, so we were constantly taking tests, filling out personality profiles, and self-assessment questionnaires. I vividly remember completing a profile a few weeks into the course 
that measured various natural talents. I don't recall in what area I recorded my highest score, but my lowest score was in creativity. That crushed me. Not only did I value creativity and desire it, but I knew I required it in order to pursue my chosen profession. I was studying to go into the ministry. That meant that I would be spending hours and hours every week of my life writing, and I would speak to an audience at least two or three times a week for the next four decades. If I don't have the innate ability to come up with the creative thoughts myself, I thought that I'll mine the creative thoughts of others. I knew that I could become a collector of thoughts more easily than I could become a creator of thoughts. Every day during the three and a half decades since then, I have read great books, gathered great thoughts, and filed them away by subject for future use. For years, as I've written lessons and books, when I need a quote, story, or article on a topic, I need only to look in my files to find several excellent pieces of material that I had filed away just for such an occasion. By becoming a person who was always on the lookout for creative ideas by others, I learned to become a creative thinker myself. You can change your way of thinking just as I did. Creative thinking isn't necessarily original thinking. Most often, creative thinking is a composite of other thoughts a person discovers along the way. Even the great artists, whom we consider to be highly original, learned from the masters before them, modeled their work on that of others, and brought together a host of ideas and styles to create their own work in the form of something new. Do you consider yourself to be highly creative? Perhaps you're not even sure what I mean when I begin to ask about whether you are a creative thinker. Let me explain a few of my observations. These are characteristics that creative thinkers have in common. Creative thinkers value ideas. Creativity is about having ideas, lots of them. You will have ideas only if you value ideas. People most often explore ideas in their own areas of interest. For example, that's what my wife Margaret does. She has a great love for design and interior decoration. Often when we're out together looking for antiques or decor items, I am amazed at how quickly she can find exactly what she's looking for. Margaret gets dozens of catalogs and magazines, and she regularly reviews them to see new items and trends. Because she values ideas, she always has lots of them. Creative thinkers explore options. I've yet to meet a creative thinker who didn't love options. Exploring a multitude of possibilities helps to stimulate the imagination. And when it comes to creativity, imagination is crucial. People who know me well will tell you that I place a very high value on options. Why? Because they provide the key to finding the best answer, not the only answer. For example, whenever team members come to me with a problem, I insist that they also supply three possible ways to solve them as well. Anyone can point out a problem. Only people who think well can present possible solutions. Creative thinkers embrace ambiguity. Creative people don't feel the need to stamp out uncertainty. They see all kinds of inconsistencies and gaps in life, and they often take delight in exploring those gaps or in using their imagination to fill them in themselves. Creative thinkers celebrate the offbeat. Creativity, by its very nature, often explores off the beaten path and goes against the grain. Diplomat and longtime president of Yale University, Keenman Brewster, said, There is a correlation between the creative and the screwball, so we must suffer the screwball gladly. To foster creativity in yourself or others, be willing to tolerate a little oddness. Creative thinkers connect the unconnected. Because a major aspect of creativity is based on utilizing others' ideas, there's great value in being able to connect one idea to another, especially to seemingly unrelated ideas. Years ago, when I began learning how to connect seemingly unconnected thoughts, I realized that it could often create something special. When you were a kid, did you ever play Connect the Dots? When you first looked at the page, it was just a jumble of dots. As you connected the dots, the picture the creator had envisioned emerged at the end of your pencil. 
It's easy to connect the dots if you know where you're going. Likewise, it's easy to connect ideas when you have a plan. Once you begin to think, you are free to collect. You ask yourself, what material relates to this thought? Once you have the material, you ask, what ideas can make the thought better? After that, you can correct or refine it by asking, what changes can make these ideas better? Finally, you connect the ideas by positioning them in the right context to make the thought complete and powerful. Creative thinkers don't fear failure. I firmly believe that overcoming failure is a key to success in life. In fact, I wrote a book based on the belief entitled Failing Forward. The thesis of the book is that the difference between average people and achieving people is their perception of and response to failure. But when it comes to creativity, the ability to be unafraid of failure is even more important. Why is that so crucial? Because creativity equals failure. Creativity requires a willingness to look stupid. It means getting out on a limb, knowing that the limb often breaks. Creative people know these things and still keep searching for new ideas. They just don't let the ideas that don't work prevent them from coming up with more ideas that do work. I believe creativity can improve a person's quality of life. Here are five specific things creative thinking has the potential to do for you. Creative thinking adds value to everything. Wouldn't you enjoy having a limitless reservoir of ideas that you could draw upon at any time? That's what creative thinking gives you. For that reason, no matter what you are currently able to do, creativity can make you capable of more. Creativity is being able to see what everybody else has seen and think what nobody else has thought so that you can do what nobody else has done. Sometimes creative thinking lies along the lines of invention, where you break new ground. Other times it moves along the lines of innovation, which helps you to do old things in a new way. But either way, it's seeing the world through sufficiently new eyes so that new solutions appear. Creative thinking compounds. 25 years ago, I became passionate about wanting to write books that would add value to people. With great zeal, I started working on my first book. Then the cold water of reality began to douse my flames of passion for writing. I discovered that writing was difficult. I stuck with it and kept working on becoming more creative. Today I've written over 30 books, and I have at least seven more that I want to write. A young would-be author recently asked me, How do you write 30 books? My answer was simple, one word at a time. Over the years, I have found the following to be true. Creative thinking is hard work, but creative thinking compounds given enough time and focus. Creative thinking draws people to you and your ideas. Why do people continue to be fascinated by Leonardo da Vinci? Creativity is intelligence having fun. People admire intelligence, and they are always attracted to fun, so the combination is fantastic. If anyone could be said to have fun with his intelligence, it was da Vinci. The diversity of his ideas and expertise is incredible. He was a painter, architect, sculptor, anatomist, musician, inventor, and engineer. The term Renaissance man was coined because of him. Just as people were drawn to da Vinci and his ideas during his lifetime, and for centuries afterward, they are drawn to creative people today. If you cultivate creativity, you will become more attractive to other people, and they will be drawn to you. Creative thinking helps you learn more. It almost seems too obvious to say, but if you are always actively seeking new ideas, you will learn. Creativity is teachability. It's seeing more solutions than problems, and the greater the quantity of thoughts, the greater the chance for learning something new. Finally, creative thinking challenges the status quo. If you desire to improve your world or even your own situation, then creativity will help you. The status quo and creativity are incompatible. Creativity and innovation always walk hand in hand. A good illustration of how someone challenged the status quo through creativity can be seen in the story of Elvis Presley's estate after his death. Elvis left everything in a trust for Lisa Marie, his young daughter. 
In 1979, Lisa Marie's mother, Priscilla, became a co-executor of the trust and found that if something wasn't done, and quickly, the estate was on the road to ruin. Throughout his career, Elvis had received less than half of what he earned. Colonel Tom Parker, his manager, had a contract that took 50% of everything Elvis made right off the top. That and a lifestyle of free spending meant that Elvis was often strapped for cash. Several years before he died, Elvis sold off the rights to most of his recordings to raise money. Consequently, his estate received no royalty income from his music. Add to that situation a huge inheritance tax imposed by the government and an empty mansion, Graceland, gobbling up money through taxes and upkeep, and you can see that the situation looked bleak. Priscilla Presley started to think creatively. First, she took the little remaining cash from the estate and invested it into Graceland. Rather than selling it, she opened it up to the public as a tourist attraction. Just 38 days after it opened in 1982, it earned back its investment. The next thing she did was sever ties with Tom Parker so that 50% of the estate's earnings would not continue being funneled to him. Finally, Priscilla began to treat Elvis as a brand. She even promoted legislation in Tennessee to make his likeness intellectual property which would belong to his estate. By using creative thinking, Priscilla Presley turned what looked like an impossible situation into a business empire that earns tens of millions of dollars a year. At this point, you may be saying, okay, I'm convinced that creative thinking is important, but how do I find the latent creativity within me? How do I discover the joy of creative thought? Here are five ways to do it. Number one, remove creativity killers. Take a listen to the following phrases. They are almost guaranteed to kill creative thinking any time you hear or think of them. I'm not a creative person. Follow the rules. Don't ask questions. Don't be different. Stay within the lines. There is only one way. Don't be foolish. Be practical. Be serious. Think of your image. That's not logical. It's not practical. It's never been done. It can't be done. It didn't work for them. We tried that before. It's too much work. We can't afford to make a mistake. It will be too hard to administer. We don't have the time. We don't have the money. Yes, but play is frivolous. Failure is final. If you think you have a great idea, don't let anyone talk you out of it, even if it sounds foolish. Don't let yourself or anyone else subject you to creativity killers. After all, you can't do something new and exciting if you force yourself to stay in the same old rut. Number two, think creatively by asking the right questions. Creativity is largely a matter of asking the right questions. Wrong questions shut down the process of creative thinking. They direct thinkers down the same old path, or they chide them into believing that thinking isn't necessary at all. To stimulate creative thinking, ask yourself questions such as, Why must it be done this way? What is the root problem? What are the underlying issues? What does this remind me of? What is the opposite? What metaphor or symbol helps to explain it? Why is it important? What's the hardest or most expensive way to do it? Who has a different perspective on this? What happens if we don't do it at all? You get the idea, and you can probably come up with better questions yourself. Number three, develop a creative environment. Negative environments are responsible for the death of thousands of great ideas every minute. A creative environment on the other hand, becomes like a greenhouse where ideas are seeded, sprout up, and flourish. A creative environment encourages creativity. When innovation and good thinking are openly encouraged and rewarded, then people see that they have permission to be creative. A creative environment places a high value on trust among team members and individuality. Creativity always risks failure. That's why trust is so important to creative people. In the creative process, trust comes from the fact that the people working together want what's best for the organization and each other. It comes from knowing that people on the team have experience launching successful creative ideas. And it comes from the assurance 
that the time coming up with creative ideas won't go to waste because the ideas will be implemented. A creative environment embraces those who are creative. Creative people are sometimes off-center. When it comes to how creative people should be treated, I take the advice of Tom Peters, who says, Weed out the dollars, nurture the nuts. A creative environment focuses on innovation, not just invention. Creative people say, give me a good idea and I'll give you a better idea. Fortunately, I learned this lesson early. Often I take an idea that someone else gives me and raise it to a higher level. For example, when I speak at one of my conferences, I frequently share with the audience the book idea I'm currently working on. Then I invite audience members to share their thoughts, ideas, and illustrations with me to make the book better. I tell them, I'll take what you give me, make it better, and give you the credit. <laughs> then I smile and say, then I'll sell you the book. A creative environment places a high value on options. Creative people are always thinking about and looking for other ways of doing things because they know that options bring opportunities. When anyone in my inner circle brings me an item requiring a decision, I ask for three things. The best information possible, three possible options, and their reasoning behind the option they would choose. I have found that this kind of optional thinking often produces the best results. A creative environment is willing to let people go outside the lines. Most people automatically stay within the lines, even if they have been arbitrarily drawn or are terribly out of date. Remember, most limitations we face in life are not imposed on us by others. We place them there ourselves. Lack of creativity often falls into that category. If you want to be more creative, challenge boundaries. A creative environment appreciates the power of a dream. A creative environment encourages the use of a blank sheet of paper and the question, if we could draw a picture of what we want to accomplish, what would it look like? A creative environment allowed Martin Luther King, Jr. to speak with passion to millions of people. I have a dream, not I have a goal. Goals may give people focus, but dreams give them power. Dreams expand people's world. Number four, spend time with other creative people. What if the place you work has an environment that is hostile to creativity and you possess little ability to change it? One possibility would be to change jobs. But what if you desire to keep working there despite the negative environment? Your best option is to find a way to spend time with other creative people. Creativity is contagious. Have you ever noticed what happens during a good brainstorming session? One person throws out an idea. Another person uses it as a springboard. To discover another idea. Someone else takes it in yet another even better direction. Then somebody grabs hold of it and takes it to a whole new level. The interplay of ideas can be electric. The more time you can spend with creative people engaging in creative activities, the more creative you will become. Number five, get out of your box. Actress Katherine Hepburn remarked, if you obey all the rules, you will miss all the fun. While I don't think it's necessary to break all the rules, many are in place to protect us, I do think it's unwise to allow self-imposed limitations to hinder us. Creative thinkers know that they must repeatedly break out of the box of their own history and personal limitations in order to experience creative breakthroughs. The most effective way to help yourself get out of the box is to expose yourself to new paradigms. One way you can do that is by traveling to new places. Explore other cultures, countries, and traditions. Find out how people very different from you live and think. Another is to read on new subjects. If you want to break out of your own box, get into somebody else's. Read broadly. Many people mistakenly believe that if individuals aren't born with creativity, then they will never be creative. But you can see from the many strategies and examples I've given you that creativity can be cultivated. Here's a thinking question for you. Ask yourself, am I working to break out of my box of limitations so that I can explore ideas and options to experience creative breakthroughs? Putting creative thinking into action. If you've been using some method of capturing your ideas in a notebook, computer, or filing system, 
I want you to take time and look through some of the ideas that you've recorded. If you haven't been capturing your ideas on paper, you're missing an opportunity to take them to the next level. I want you to begin capturing ideas on paper for the next 90 days. Look through your ideas and find one that you believe has great potential if you give it more thinking time. Now ask yourself the following questions to stretch that idea. Why do I like this idea? What are the underlying issues involved with it? What does this remind me of? What is the opposite? What metaphor or symbol helps explain it? What is the value of the idea? What's the hardest or most expensive way to carry it out? Who has a different perspective on this? What happens if I don't do it at all? In my wildest dreams, what can this idea lead to? Now I want to encourage you to add other questions on your own. The idea is to get outside of your box and let your ideas take you anywhere they want you to. The only rules are, number one, you're not allowed to shut down your thinking process with self-editing, criticism, or other creativity killers. And two, you must try to capture as many of your ideas as possible on paper. Now think about your working environment. Does it naturally foster creativity or tend to shut it down? If it promotes creative thought, count your blessings. If it doesn't, figure out if you can make it friendlier to creativity. If you're the boss, then changing the culture is your responsibility. Praise and reward creative thinking and innovation. Introduce play. Give people time to go recharge their mental batteries. Hire a consultant to teach people how to think out of the box. Do whatever is necessary. And if you have the resources to go to another country where you can be exposed to a different culture, you may want to plan your next vacation around it. If you don't, then plan to read three books that take you out of your area of expertise. Don't pick something that will bore you or that will go way over your head. Just expose yourself to something that makes you stretch your mind. Chapter 7. Recognize the importance of realistic thinking. When I started my career fresh out of school, I was an idealistic thinker, not a realistic one. Some of my misconceptions were that I could make everyone happy. People like change if it was done properly. The leader taking care of people is enough. Good leadership makes tough calls unnecessary. The reality was that there will be conflict among people. People resist change regardless. People must be developed to be effective, and tough calls must always be made. Over the years, misconceptions fell one by one, and in time, I evolved into a more realistic thinker. That process went in phases for me. First, I did not engage in realistic thinking at all. After a while, I realized it was necessary, so I began to engage in it occasionally, but I didn't like it because I thought it was too negative. Eventually, I found that I had to engage in realistic thinking after I got in any kind of trouble if I was going to solve problems and learn from my mistakes. And in time, I became willing to think realistically before I got in trouble and make it a continual part of my life. Today, I encourage my key leaders to think realistically, and we make realistic thinking the foundation of our business because we derive certainty and security from it. Cultivating the ability to be realistic in your thinking will not undermine your faith in people, nor will it lessen your ability to see and seize opportunities. Instead, it will add value to you in the following ways. Realistic thinking minimizes downside risk. Actions always have consequences. Realistic thinking helps you to determine what those consequences could be. And that's crucial, because only by recognizing and considering the consequences can you plan for them. If you plan for the worst-case scenario, you can minimize the downside risk. Realistic thinking gives you a target and a game plan. I've known business people who were not realistic thinkers. Here's the good news. They were very positive and had a high degree of hope for their business. Here's the bad news. Hope is not a strategy. Realistic thinking leads to excellence in leadership and management because it requires people to define their target and develop a game plan to hit it. When people engage in realistic thinking, they also begin to simplify practices and procedures, which results in better efficiency. Realistic thinking is a catalyst for change. 
People who rely on hope for their success rarely make change a high priority in their lives. If you only have hope, you imply that achievement and success are out of your hands. It's a matter of luck or chance. Why bother changing? Realistic thinking can dispel that kind of an attitude. There's nothing like staring reality in the face to make a person recognize the need for change. Change alone doesn't bring growth, but you cannot have growth without change. Realistic thinking provides security. Anytime you have thought through the worst that can happen in a situation and you have a contingency plan to meet it, you become more confident and secure. Realistic thinking gives you credibility. If you are a leader, you will find that realistic thinking helps people to buy into your vision. Leaders who are continually surprised by the unexpected soon lose credibility with their followers. On the other hand, leaders who think realistically and plan accordingly position their organizations to win and that gives their people confidence in them. The best leaders ask realistic questions before casting vision to others. They ask themselves things like, is it possible? Does this dream include everyone or just a few? Have I identified and articulated the areas that will make this dream difficult to achieve? Realistic thinking provides a foundation to build on. Thomas Edison once observed, the value of a good idea is in using it. The bottom line on realistic thinking is that it helps you to make an idea usable by taking away the wish factor. Most ideas and efforts don't accomplish their intended results because they rely too much on what we wish rather than what is. Realistic thinking is a friend to those in trouble. If creativity is what you would do if you were not afraid of the possibility of failure, then reality is dealing with failure if it does happen. Realistic thinking gives you something concrete to fall back on during times of trouble. Certainty in the midst of uncertainty brings stability. Realistic thinking brings the dream to fruition. If you don't get close enough to a problem, you can't tackle it. If you don't take a realistic look at your dream and what it will take to achieve it, you will never achieve it. Realistic thinking helps to pave the way for bringing any dream to fruition. Because I'm naturally optimistic rather than realistic, I've had to take concrete steps to improve my thinking in this area. Here are five things I do to improve my realistic thinking. Number one, develop an appreciation for truth. President Harry S. Truman said, I never give them hell. I just tell them the truth and they think it's hell. That's the way many people react to truth. However, if you want to become a realistic thinker, you need to get comfortable dealing with the truth. Number two, do your homework. When dealing with an issue, you must first get the facts. It doesn't matter how sound your thinking is if you're basing it on faulty data or assumptions. Another kind of homework you can do is to find out what others have done in similar circumstances. Remember, your thinking doesn't necessarily have to be original. It just has to be solid. Why not learn all that you can from good thinkers who have faced similar situations in the past? Number three. Think through the pros and cons. There is nothing like taking the time to really examine the pros and cons of an issue to give you a strong dose of reality. It rarely comes down to a matter of simply choosing the course of action with the greatest number of pros because all pros and cons do not carry equal weight. But that's not the value of the exercise anyway. The value is that it helps you dig into the facts examine an issue from all angles, and really count the cost of a possible course of action. Number four, picture the worst case scenario. The essence of realistic thinking is discovering, picturing, and examining the worst case scenario. Ask yourself questions such as, what if sales fall short of projections? What if revenue hits rock bottom? Not an optimist rock bottom, but real rock bottom. What if we don't win the account? What if the clients don't pay us? What if we have to do a job shorthanded? What if our best player gets sick? What if all the colleges reject my application? What if the market goes belly up? What if the volunteers quit? What if nobody shows up? You get the idea. The point is that you need to think about worst-case possibilities 
Whether you are running a business, leading a department, pastoring a church, coaching a team, or planning your personal finances. Your goal isn't to be negative or expect the worst, just to be ready for it in case it happens. And number five, align your thinking with your resources. One of the keys to maximizing realistic thinking is aligning your resources with your objectives. Looking at pros and cons and examining worst case scenarios will make you aware of any gaps between what you desire and what really exists. Once you know what those gaps are, you can use your resources to fill them. After all, that's what resources are for. Here's a thinking question for you. Ask yourself, am I building a solid mental foundation on facts so that I can think with certainty? Putting realistic thinking into action. Ask yourself, what is your natural bent? Is it toward optimism or realism? Listen to the following phrases describing what I went through in my evolution to a more realistic thinker plus one more level I have not yet achieved and see which statement best describes where you are. Number one, I do not engage in realistic thinking. Number two, I do not like realistic thinking. Number three, I will let someone else do realistic thinking. Number four, I will do realistic thinking only after I am in trouble. Number five, I will do realistic thinking before I am in trouble. Six, I will continually make realistic thinking part of my life. Number seven, I will encourage my key leaders to do the same. Number eight, I will make realistic thinking the foundation of our business. Nine, I will derive certainty and security from realistic thinking. And number ten, I rely heavily on facts and often make judgments according to the worst case scenario. You can base your need for progress in the area of realistic thinking on your answer. The lower your number, the more you need to grow. Now, if your ability to think realistically isn't highly developed, then maybe you need a strong dose of truth. Ask five perceptive people, friends, co-workers, your spouse, your supervisor, etc., to talk to you about your three greatest strengths and your three greatest weaknesses. Ideally, they should write their observations and explain them to you. As they talk, you are not allowed to defend yourself. You are only allowed to ask questions that help you to understand their observations. Make notes if necessary. Take all of the comments you receive along with your notes and plan to spend a whole day examining yourself in light of what you were told. Think about how their comments can help you and how you can change to improve in your areas of weakness and capitalize on your strengths. The first step in gaining an appreciation for the truth is learning to deal with the truth about yourself. Finally, the next time you have a problem to solve or a project to complete, use the guidelines from this chapter to help you cultivate a more realistic view of the issues. Be sure to do your homework, work through the pros and cons, find the worst case scenario, align your thinking and your resources, and go through all four steps before you take action. Chapter 8. Release the Power of Strategic Thinking When you hear the words strategic thinking, what comes to mind? Do you conjure up marketing plans, the kind that can turn a company around? Perhaps you contemplate global politics, or you recall some of history's greatest military campaigns. Hannibal crossing the Alps to surprise the Roman army. Charlemagne's conquest of Western Europe or the Allies' D-Day invasion of Normandy. Strategic thinking is often associated with war. In fact, a common dictionary defines it as the science of planning and directing large-scale military operations, specifically, as distinguished from tactics, of maneuvering forces into the most advantageous position prior to actual engagement with the enemy. Even the most basic definition uses a military application and distinguishes tactics from strategic thinking. Tactics are actions taken in battle while strategies are plans prior to it. But strategy doesn't have to be restricted to military action or even to business. Strategic thinking can make a positive impact in any area of life. I am very strategic in the area of time management. I have observed that most people try to plan their lives one day at a time. 
Some people plan their lives a week at a time. They review their calendar for the week, check their appointments, review their goals, and then get to work. They generally outachieve most of their colleagues. I try to take that one step further. At the beginning of every month, I spend half a day working on my calendar for the next 40 days. 40 days works for me rather than just 30. That way I get a jump on the next month. I begin by reviewing my travel schedule and planning my activities with my family. Then I review what projects, lessons, and other objectives I want to accomplish during those five to six weeks. Then I start blocking out days and times for thinking, writing, working, meeting with people, etc. I set times to do fun things such as seeing a show, watching a ball game, or playing golf. I also set aside small blocks of time for the unexpected. By the time I'm done, I can tell you nearly everything I'll be doing almost hour by hour during the coming weeks. This strategy is one of the reasons I have been able to accomplish so much. The benefits of strategic thinking are numerous. Here are a few of the reasons you should adopt it as one of your thinking tools. Strategic thinking simplifies the difficult. Strategic thinking takes complex issues and long-term objectives, which can be very difficult to address, and breaks them down into manageable sizes. Strategic thinking can also help you simplify the management of everyday life. One of the ways I do that is by using systems, which are nothing more than good strategies repeated. Writing a lesson or a speech can be difficult, but because I use my system to file quotes, stories, and articles when I need something to flesh out or illustrate a point, I simply go to one of my 1,200 files and find a good piece of material that works. I use systems for everything. I have a system for getting in and out of airports quickly and efficiently. When I go to meetings, I take people with me who will need to carry the ball afterwards so that I never have to repeat information or instructions to them. I take projects with me on airplanes and books into waiting rooms. My wife Margaret and I even have a system for how we shop so that if we get separated or have to meet each other, we can find each other in five minutes. Just about any difficult task can be made simpler with strategic thinking. Strategic thinking prompts you to ask the right questions. One of the ways to break down complex or difficult issues is to ask questions. Strategic thinking forces you through this process. For example, listen to the following questions developed by my friend Bob Beale, the author of Master Planning. Direction. What should we do next and why? Organization. Who is responsible for what? Who is responsible for whom? Do we have the right people in the right places? Cash. What is our projected expense? Can we afford it? How can we afford it? Tracking. Are we on target? Overall evaluation. Are we achieving the quality we expect and demand of ourselves? Refinement. How can we be more effective and more efficient, moving toward the ideal? These may not be the only questions you need to ask to begin formulating a strategic plan, but they are certainly a good start. Strategic thinking prompts customization. General George S. Patton once observed, Successful generals make plans to fit circumstances, but do not try to create circumstances to fit plans. An excellent illustration of Patton's belief can be seen in the circumstances surrounding the Battle of the Bulge, the last major German offensive of World War II. On December 19, 1945, Patton, commanding General Dwight D. Eisenhower and Generals Bradley and Devers, met in Verdun to discuss how to combat the German counteroffensive. The 101st Airborne Division was trapped and the more time that passed before an attempt was made to rescue them, the worse off they would be. It was decided that Patton should attack the southern flank of the Bulge with his Third Army. Patton had three divisions at his disposal and had calculated that he would be ready to stage his offensive in four days. Patton recalled, General Eisenhower stated that I should wait until I got at least six divisions. I told him that, in my opinion, a prompt attack with three was better than waiting for six, particularly when I did not know where I could get the other three. Eisenhower agreed to allow Patton to attack, which he did one day ahead of schedule. As a result, the German forces were contained. Their counteroffensive was defeated, and the war came to an end earlier than it would have otherwise. All good strategic thinkers try to match the strategy specifically with the problem because strategy isn't a one-size-fits-all proposition. 
The intention to customize and strategic thinking forces a person to go beyond vague ideas and engage in specific ways to go after a task or problem. It sharpens the mind. Strategic thinking prepares you today for an uncertain tomorrow. Peter Drucker, the father of modern management, explains the importance of strategic thinking. He says, Strategic planning is necessary precisely because we cannot forecast. Strategic planning does not deal with future decisions. It deals with the futurity of present decisions. Decisions exist only in the present. The question that faces the strategic decision maker is not what his organization should do tomorrow. It is, what do we have to do today to be ready for an uncertain tomorrow? Strategic thinking is the bridge that links where you are to where you want to be. It gives direction and credibility today and increases your potential for success tomorrow. Strategic thinking reduces the margin of error. Any time you shoot from the hip or go into a totally reactive mode, you increase your margin for error. However, strategic thinking greatly reduces that margin for error. It lines your actions up with your objectives. The better aligned you are with your target, the better the odds that you will be going in the right direction. Strategic thinking gives you influence with others. The one with a plan is the one with a power. Employees want to follow the business leader who has a good business plan. Volunteers want to join up with the pastor who has a good ministry plan. Children want to be with the adult who has the well-thought-out vacation plan. If you practice strategic thinking, others will listen to you and they will want to follow you. And if you possess a position of leadership in an organization, Strategic thinking is essential. To become a better strategic thinker who is able to formulate and implement plans that will achieve the desired objective, take the following seven guidelines to heart. Number one, break down the issue. My friend Robert Schuller, founder of the Crystal Cathedral, says, Yard by yard, life is hard, but inch by inch, it's a cinch. The first step in strategic thinking is to break down an issue into smaller, more manageable parts so that you can focus on them more effectively. How you do it is not as important as just doing it. For example, one way to break an issue down is by function. That's what automotive innovator Henry Ford did when he created the assembly line. That's why he said nothing is particularly hard if you divide it into small jobs. How you break down an issue is up to you, whether it's by function, timetable, responsibility, purpose, or some other method. The point is that you need to break it down. Only one person in a million can juggle the whole thing in his mind and think strategically to create solid, viable plans. Number two, ask why before how. When most people begin using strategic thinking to solve a problem or plan a way to meet an objective, they often make the mistake of jumping the gun and trying immediately to figure out how to accomplish it. Instead of asking how, they should first ask why. If you jump right into problem-solving mode, how are you going to know what all the issues are? Number three, identify the real issues and objectives. William Feather, the author of The Business of Life, said, Before it can be solved, a problem must be clearly defined. I think many people rush to solutions, and as a result, they end up solving the wrong problem. How do you avoid that? By asking probing questions in an effort to expose the real issues by challenging all of your assumptions, by collecting information even after you think you've identified the issue. You may still have to act with incomplete data, but you don't want to jump to a conclusion before you gather enough to begin identifying the real issue. Begin by asking, what else could be the real issue? You should also remove any personal agenda. More than anything else, that can cloud your judgment while trying to do strategic thinking. Once the real issues are identified, the solutions are often simple. Number four, review your resources. A strategy that doesn't take into account available resources is doomed to failure. Take an inventory. How much time do you have? How much money? What kind of materials, supplies, or inventory do you have? What are the other assets? What liabilities or obligations will come into play? Which people on the team can make an impact? You know your own organization and profession. Figure out what resources you have at your disposal. Number five, develop your plan. 
How you approach the planning process depends greatly on your profession and the size of the challenge that you're planning to tackle, so it's difficult for me to recommend many specifics. However, Rolf Smith, the author of The Seven Levels of Change, the guide to innovation in the world's largest corporations, has some good advice that I think can help you. As the title of his book suggests, he outlines seven kinds of change which may prompt you in your planning process. They are, level one, effectiveness, doing the right things. Level two, efficiency, doing the right things right. Level three, improving, doing things better. Level four, cutting, doing away with things. Level five, adapting, doing things other people are doing. Level six, different, doing things no one else is doing. And then level seven, impossible, doing things that can't be done. No matter how you go about planning, take this advice. Start with the obvious. When you tackle an issue or plan that way, it brings unity and consensus to the team because those things are apparent to everyone. Those obvious elements build mental momentum and initiate creativity and intensity. Building on the fundamentals is the best way to lay down the road to the complex. Number six, put the right people in the right place. It's critical that you include your team as part of your strategic thinking. Before you can implement your plan, you must make sure that you have the right people in place. Even the best strategic thinking won't help you if you don't take into account the people part of the equation. Number seven, keep repeating the process. If you expect to solve any major problem once, you're in for disappointment. Major issues need major strategic thinking time. If you want to be an effective strategic thinker, then you need to be a continuous strategic thinker. Here's a thinking question that I want you to ask. Ask yourself, am I implementing strategic plans that give me direction for today and increase my potential for tomorrow? Putting strategic thinking into action. Ask yourself, might you be missing opportunities because you have been too quick to ask how instead of why? Think about a major objective that you are currently planning for. Set aside one hour a day for a week to ask nothing but why questions concerning your objective. You can invite people to brainstorm with you at some point, but spend the majority of the time just thinking alone. Be particularly alert for any opportunities that might be present that you had not yet seen. Then ask yourself, what are you currently doing that is not strategic for you? You may be spending more hours than you should working in areas of weakness. Take some time to create an inventory of your personal strengths and then match it against your calendar and to-do list or a log tracking your activities over a month. If your talents and resources don't match up with your activities, then you need to dedicate some strategic thinking time to figure out how you can make a transition. Now, if you have a track record of misdiagnosing problems and applying the wrong kinds of solutions to them, then you need to spend some time with a good strategic thinker. Find people whose wisdom and discernment you admire, who have a history of successful problem solving, and spend some time with them. Ask to sit in on problem solving meetings as an observer. Take problems to them for brainstorming sessions. The idea is to learn how they think so you can begin developing similar thinking strategies. Lastly, create a thinking schedule. Dedicate specific blocks of time to specific issues. Don't forget to break them down so that you can really focus. Chapter 9. Feel the Energy of Possibility Thinking In 1975, filmmaker George Lucas went to see Doug Trumbull, the man with the best reputation for special effects in Hollywood. Trumbull was the expert who had worked on 2001 A Space Odyssey, the first film that gave space travel a realistic feel and look. Lucas was young and relatively inexperienced. He had made only two feature films for theatrical release, but he had proven himself in the business by writing and directing American Graffiti. Lucas had a vision for the new film that he wanted to make. It was to be a story in a science fiction setting that would be a swashbuckling adventure, a Thurian quest and western style showdown, all rolled into one. 
Lucas wanted to create scenes with fast-moving ships zooming through space, similar to the way airplanes are filmed in a dogfight. It was something that had never been done. In his book, Industrial Light and Magic, The Art of Special Effects, author and filmmaker Thomas G. Smith says, The experienced vision effects people didn't take George seriously. They told him such rapid movement would cause a strobing effect on screen. Lucas believed it could be done. John Dykstra, a young filmmaker who had worked with Trumbull, believed in Lucas's vision, too. Lucas hired him and created his own special effects company in order to create the images he wanted. He called it Industrial Light and Magic. Dykstra started gathering together a team of technicians. Together they designed and built a studio and began inventing and assembling the technology needed to make the impossible possible. They worked for almost two years to create what Lucas wanted. The result was the movie Star Wars. Industrial Light and Magic, the company that he had founded just to make the special effects for Star Wars possible, has set the standard for special effects for over two and a half decades. It has gone on to provide special effects for eight of the ten highest grossing movies of all time, and in the process it has won 12 Academy Awards. But first and foremost, it is George Lucas's tool to help him realize his vision. People who embrace possibility thinking are capable of doing even seemingly impossible tasks when they believe in solutions. Here are several reasons why you should become a possibility thinker. Possibility thinking increases your possibilities. When you believe you can do something difficult and you succeed, it opens many doors for you. When George Lucas founded Industrial Light and Magic, he had another source of revenue to help underwrite his own projects. Possibility thinking draws opportunities and people to you. People who think big attract big people to them. If you want to achieve big things, you need to become a possibility thinker. Possibility thinking increases others' possibilities. Big thinkers who make things happen also create possibilities for others. That happens in part because it's contagious. You can't help but become more confident and think bigger when you're around possibility thinkers. But possibility thinking also impacts others in more direct ways. Look at what happened in Atlanta, Georgia in 1987. A real estate attorney named Billy Payne thought it would be possible to bring the Olympics to Atlanta. People told him it couldn't be done. But Payne kept believing and working at it. And of course, in 1996, the Summer Olympics were held in Atlanta. Possibility thinking allows you to dream big dreams. No matter what your profession is, possibility thinking can help you to broaden your horizons and dream bigger dreams. In 1970, when I was a 23-year-old, I read a book called Move Ahead with Possibility Thinking by Robert Schuller. As a young pastor in my first church, I was thrilled to read about how Schuller overcame seemingly impossible circumstances to build a huge church in Garden Grove, California. If you embrace possibility thinking, your dreams will go from molehill to mountain size, and because you believe in possibilities, you put yourself in position to achieve them. Possibility thinking makes it possible to rise above average. During the 1970s, when oil prices went through the roof, automobile makers were directed to make their cars more fuel efficient. One manufacturer asked a group of senior engineers to drastically reduce the weight of the cars they were designing. They concluded that making lighter cars couldn't be done, would be too expensive, and would present too many safety concerns. What was the automaker's solution? They gave the problem to a group of less experienced engineers. The new group found ways to reduce the weight of the company's automobiles by hundreds of pounds. Because they thought that solving the problem was possible, it was. Possibility thinking gives you energy. There is a direct correlation between possibility thinking and the level of a person's energy. Who gets energized by losing? If you know something can't succeed, how much time and energy are you willing to give it? Nobody goes looking for a lost cause. You invest yourself in what you believe can succeed. When you embrace possibility thinking, you believe in what you're doing, and that gives you energy. Possibility thinking keeps you from giving up. Above all, possibility thinkers believe they can succeed. If you believe you can do something, you have already won much of the battle. 
If you believe you can't, then it doesn't matter how hard you try, because you have already lost. One of the people who showed himself to be a great possibility thinker in 2001 was New York Mayor Rudy Giuliani. In the hours following the World Trade Center tragedy, Giuliani not only led the city through the chaos of disaster, but he instilled confidence in everyone he touched. Afterward, he gave some insight and perspective on it. I was so proud of the people I saw on the street. No chaos, but they were frightened and confused, and it seemed to me that they needed to hear from my heart where I thought we were going. I was trying to think. Where can I go for some comparison to this, some lessons on how to handle this? So I started thinking about Churchill, started thinking that we're going to have to rebuild the spirit of the city. And what better example than Churchill and the people of London during the Blitz of 1940 who had to keep up their spirit during this sustained bombing? It was a comforting thought. Some people are naturally negative or cynical. They believe that possibility thinkers are naive or foolish. If your thinking runs toward pessimism, let me ask you a question. How many highly successful people do you know who are continually negative? How many impossibility thinkers are you acquainted with who achieve big things? None. People with an it-can't-be-done mindset have two choices. They can expect the worst and continually experience it, or they can change their thinking. If you want possibility thinking to work for you, then begin by following these six suggestions. Number one, stop focusing on the impossibilities. The first step in becoming a possibility thinker is to stop yourself from searching for and dwelling on what's wrong with any given issue. If possibility thinking is new to you, you're going to have to give yourself a lot of coaching to eliminate some of the negative self-talk you may hear in your head. When you automatically start mentally listing all the things that can go wrong or all the reasons something can't be done, stop yourself and say, don't go there. Then ask, what's right about this? That will help you get started. And if negativity is a really big problem for you and pessimistic things come out of your mouth before you even thought them through, you may need to enlist the aid of a friend or family member to alert you every time you utter negative ideas aloud. Number two, stay away from the experts. So-called experts do more to shoot down people's dreams than just about anybody else. In the book Future Edge, Joel Barker recounts a few statements made by experts that seem comical now. Those remarks highlight that expertise in an area doesn't prevent someone from selling a dream short. Here are the comments along with when they were said. The phonograph is of no commercial value. Thomas Edison said that concerning his own invention in 1880. There is no likelihood man can ever tap the power of the atom. Robert Millikan, Nobel Prize winner in physics in 1920. It is an idle dream to imagine that automobiles will take the place of railways in the long-distance movement of passengers. The American Road Congress said that in 1913. I think there is a world market for about five computers. Thomas Watson, the chairman of IBM, said that in 1943. Possibility thinkers are very reluctant to dismiss anything as impossible. If you want to achieve something, give yourself permission to believe it is possible, no matter what experts might say. Number three, look for possibilities in every situation. Becoming a possibility thinker is more than just refusing to let yourself be negative. It's looking for positive possibilities despite the circumstances. Every situation can be seen as potentially better than it is in the present moment. I recently heard Don Soderquist, former president of Walmart, tell a wonderful story that illustrates how a person can find positive possibilities in any situation. Soderquist had gone with Sam Walton to Huntsville, Alabama to open several new stores. While they were there, Walton suggested they go and visit the competition. Here's what Soderquist said happened. We went into one, and I have to tell you that it was the worst store I've ever seen in my life. There were no customers. There was no help on the floor. The aisles were cluttered with merchandise, empty shelves, dirty. He walked one way, and I'd walk another way, and we'd meet out on the sidewalk. He said, What do you think, Don? I said, Sam, that is absolutely the worst store I've ever seen in my life. I mean, did you see the aisles? He said, Don, did you see the pantyhose rack? I said, No, I didn't, Sam. He said, That was the best pantyhose rack I've ever seen. 
I pulled the fixture out, and on the back was the name of the manufacturer. When we get back, I want you to call that manufacturer and have him come and visit with our fixture people. I want to put that rack in our stores. And he said, next, did you see the ethnic cosmetics? Do you realize that in our stores we have four feet of ethnic cosmetics? These people had 12 feet in theirs. We are absolutely missing the boat. I wrote down the distributor of some of those products, and when we get back, I want you to get hold of our cosmetic buyer and get these people in. We absolutely need to expand our ethnic cosmetics. It doesn't take a genius IQ or 20 years of experience to find the possibility in every situation. All it takes is the right attitude, and anybody can cultivate that. Number four, dream one size bigger. One of the best ways to cultivate a possibility mindset is to prompt yourself to dream one size bigger than you normally do. If you push yourself to dream more expansively, to imagine your organization one size bigger, to make your goals at least a step beyond what makes you comfortable, you will be forced to grow. And it will set you up to believe in greater possibilities. Number five, question the status quo. Most people want their lives to keep improving, yet they value peace and stability at the same time. People often lose sight of the fact that you can't improve and still stay the same. Growth means change. Change requires challenging the status quo. If you want greater possibilities, you can't settle for what you have now. Number six, find inspiration from great achievers. You can learn a lot about possibility thinking by studying great achievers. So find some achievers you admire and study them. Look for people with the attitude of Robert F. Kennedy who popularized George Bernard Shaw's stirring statement. Some men see things as they are and say, why? I dream of things that never were and say, why not? Here's a thinking question for you. Am I unleashing the enthusiasm of possibility thinking to find solutions for even seemingly impossible situations? Now, how do you put possibility thinking into action? Everyone has dreams, and many times those dreams are shot down by others. If you've had your possibility thinking put down in the past, then you need to try to recapture those dreams. Think back to a time when you were more likely to imagine yourself doing great things. What did you dream about? What was the thing in your heart that you really wanted to do? Recapture that thought, explore it, and do some dreaming with it. Now, the dream you had earlier in life may not be possible for you now, although many are if you're willing and able to pay the price. So what do you really want to do now? What is your dream? If you didn't fear failure or being laughed at, what would you do today? Take time to write that down. Then think about what would be necessary to accomplish it. The best way to do that is to look down the road 10 years and 90 days. Looking ahead 10 years will help you to set the direction in terms of the big picture. Looking ahead 90 days will help you identify specific steps to get the process started now. This week, read a biography of someone you admire. If you have the time and energy, read two or three about the same person. Make notes concerning how that person harnessed the energy of possibility thinking in his or her life. Then find three to five principles or practices from that person's life that you can apply to your own. Chapter 10, Embrace the Lessons of Reflective Thinking. I like to think of my desk as being like a stove. It's always got a lot of things cooking on it. Each item has its place, and at any given moment, I might take a pot from a back burner and move it to the front burner so that I can actively work on it or even finish it off. I got into the habit of thinking reflectively when I was a pastor. Because churches function on a weekly cycle, I used to spend time every Sunday night reviewing the previous week, reflecting on the effectiveness of the weekend's activities, and evaluating everything in order to prepare for the coming week. As I experienced the value of that kind of reflection, I began to spend at least a few minutes every day reflecting. Each time I asked myself three questions. What did I learn today? What should I share? What must I do? I found that asking myself these questions helps me to stay disciplined and accountable for how I spend my time. Every year at the end of December, I spend time reflecting on the past year. First, I gather together my calendar for the year and review how I spent my time. Then I capture some thoughts on paper. 
Here are the kinds of things I thought about concerning the year 2001. Highlights with Margaret. My personal highlights. The low points of my year. The major events of the year. The number one personal highlight in the last 12 months. The number one business highlight. What I did as far as speaking internationally in conferences and personal reflections of significance. My goal is to reflect on how I spent a year of my life, learn from my successes and mistakes, discover what I should try to repeat, and determine what I should change in the coming year. It is always a valuable process. By visiting past situations in your mind, you can think with greater understanding. Reflective thinking is like the crockpot of the mind. It encourages your thoughts to simmer until they're done. The pace of our society does not encourage reflective thinking. For most people, if they're going to do something, they would rather act than think. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm a person of action. But I'm also a reflective thinker. I know how valuable it is. Reflective thinking gives you true perspective. When our children were young and still lived at home, we used to take them on wonderful vacations each year. When we got home, they always knew that I was going to ask them two questions. What did you like best? And what did you learn? Children don't naturally grasp the value or the cost of an experience unless they are prompted. They take things for granted. I wanted my children to appreciate our trips and to learn from them. When you reflect, you're able to put an experience into perspective and you are able to gain a new appreciation for things that went unnoticed by you before. For example, for most people, only when they become parents are they able to recognize the sacrifices their parents or other people made for them. That's the kind of perspective that comes from reflection. Reflective thinking gives emotional integrity to your thought life. In the heat of an emotional moment, few people have good perspective. Most people who enjoy the thrill of an experience try to go back and recapture it again without trying to evaluate it first. It's one of the reasons there are so many thrill-seekers in our culture. Likewise, people who survive a traumatic experience avoid similar situations at all costs, which sometimes causes them to be tied into emotional knots. Reflective thinking enables you to distance yourself from the intense emotions of particularly good or bad experiences and see them with fresh eyes. Thrills of the past can be seen in the light of emotional maturity. Tragedies can also be examined in the light of truth and logic. That process can help a person stop carrying around a bunch of negative emotional baggage. Reflective thinking increases your confidence in decision-making. Have there been times when you made a snap judgment and later wondered if you did the right thing? Everybody has experienced that. Reflective thinking can help to diffuse that doubt. It also gives you confidence for the next decision. Any time you've reflected on an issue, when you're faced with it again, you don't have to repeat every step of the thinking process. You've got road markers from having been there before mentally. That compresses and speeds up thinking time and gives you confidence. And over time, it can also strengthen your intuition. Reflective thinking clarifies the big picture. When you engage in reflective thinking, one of the things you're able to do is put ideas and experiences into a more accurate context. For example, when a person loses his job, if he reflects on it, he may see a pattern of events that led to that occurrence. He will better understand what happened, why it happened, and which things were his responsibility. If he also looks at the incidents that occurred afterward, he may realize that in the larger scheme of things, he's better off in his new position because it's a better fit for his skills and desires. Without reflection, it can be very difficult to see the big picture. Reflective thinking takes a good experience and makes it a valuable experience. When you were just starting out in your career, did it seem that few people were willing to give someone without experience an opportunity? However, at the same time, you could see people who had been on their job 20 years who did their work poorly. If so, that probably frustrated you. It's not necessarily experience that is valuable. It's the insight people gain because of their experience. Reflective thinking is what turns experience into insight. An experience becomes valuable when it informs or equips us to meet new experiences. Reflective thinking helps to do that.
If you're like most people in our culture today, you probably do very little reflective thinking. Take the following five suggestions to heart to increase your ability to think reflectively. Number one, set aside time for reflection. For most people, reflection and self-examination doesn't come naturally. It can be a fairly uncomfortable activity for a variety of reasons. They have a hard time staying focused. They find the process dull. Or they don't like spending a lot of time thinking about emotionally difficult issues. But if you don't carve out the time for it, you are unlikely to do any reflective thinking. Number two, remove yourself from distractions. As much as any other kind of thinking, reflection requires solitude. Distraction and reflection simply don't mix. It's not the kind of thing you can do well near a television in a cubicle while the phone is ringing or with children in the same room. Number three, regularly review your calendar or journal. Most people use their calendar as a planning tool, which of course it is. But few people use it as a reflective thinking tool. But what could be better for helping you to review where you have been and what you have done except maybe a journal? Calendars and journals remind you of how you spent your time, show you whether your activities match your priorities, and help you to see whether you are making progress. They also offer you an opportunity to recall activities that you might not have had the time to reflect on previously. Some of the most valuable thoughts you've ever had may have been lost because you didn't give yourself the reflection time that you needed. Number four, ask the right questions. As you spend time reflecting, the value you receive from it will depend on the kind of questions you ask yourself. The better the questions, the more gold you will mine from your thinking. When I reflect, I think in terms of my values, relationships, and experiences. Here are some sample questions from each area. Thinking related to values. Personal growth. What have I learned today that will help me grow? How can I apply it to my life? When should I apply it? Adding value. To whom did I add value today? How do I know that I added value to that person? Can I follow up and compound the positive benefit that he or she received? Teamwork. What did I do with someone else that made both of us better? Would the other person agree that it was a win-win? Can we do something else together to continue our mutual success? Leadership. Did I lead by example today? Did I lift my people and my organization to a higher level? What did I do and how did I do it? Physical health. Did I exercise at my optimal heart rate for 35 minutes today? Have I exercised at least five times in the last seven days? And did I stay on my low-fat diet today? Personal faith. Did I represent God well today? Did I practice the golden rule? Have I walked the second mile with someone? Thinking related to relationships. Marriage and family. Did I communicate love to Margaret, the children, and the grandchildren today? How did I show that love? Did they feel it? Did they return it? Friends. Have I been a good friend this week? What did I do? Is there something else I need to do? Is there another friend who needs me? Inner circle. Have I spent enough time with my key players? What can I do to help them be more successful? In what areas can I mentor them? God. Have I spent time with God? What is He teaching me now? Am I learning? Am I obeying? Have I continually talked with Him today? Thinking related to experiences. Discoveries. What did I encounter today that I need to give more thinking time to? Are there lessons to be learned? Are there things to be done? Memories. Did I create a good memory for someone today? Was it because of a comment, an action, or a shared experience? Difficulties. What went wrong? Could I have changed it? What do I need to do differently next time? Successes. What went right? Did I create it? Is there a principle I can learn from this experience? People. Who did I meet? What were my impressions? Conclusions. Have I closed my day appropriately? Have I expressed gratitude? Have I learned something, loved someone? Have I enjoyed and lived the day to the fullest? And number five, cement your learning through action. Nothing helps you to grow like putting your thoughts into action. To do that, you must be intentional. 
Let me give you a few examples of how I do that. When you read a good book, there are always good thoughts, quotes, or lessons that you can take away from it and use yourself. I always mark the takeaways in a book and then reread them when I'm done with this book. When I listen to a message, I record the takeaways so that I can file them for future use. When I go to a seminar, I take good notes. If you go to a conference, revisit what you heard. The lessons that can be learned through reflective thinking don't always have to come from your own experience. I was reminded of that in January of 2002. I had the honor and the privilege of being asked by the Keene family to speak on the leadership of Martin Luther King, Jr. at Ebenezer Baptist Church in downtown Atlanta for Martin Luther King Day. As I prepared for my brief message and reviewed his accomplishments, I was struck by how reflective thinking shaped his approach to racism and civil rights issues. As a young man growing up in the South, King had suffered under Jim Crow laws and segregation. His experience birthed the desire to change the situation of African American people in the United States. To solve the problems of the present and secure a better future for his people, he reflected on the past to learn its lessons. In college, he read Henry David Thoreau's essay, Civil Disobedience. King was impressed by Thoreau's assertion that citizens had the right to disobey laws that were unjust. In fact, Thoreau had gone to jail rather than pay his taxes, which he felt were being used to support slavery. Undoubtedly, King continued to reflect on Thoreau's ideas as he wrestled with the problems of segregation and racism in the United States. Then in 1948, when he was at Crozer Theological Seminary in Pennsylvania, studying for the ministry, he heard A.J. Musty and Mordecai W. Johnson teach about Mahatma Gandhi, who was so strongly influenced by Thoreau's writings. He found that while Thoreau's philosophy promoted the idea of individual civil disobedience, Gandhi had made it a vehicle of the masses. Using it, Gandhi had liberated the people of India from British rule. Keene decided to use similar tactics at home in the United States. In the 1950s and 60s, Keene was the dominant figure of the civil rights movement. More than anyone else, he made white America wake up to problems of racism and segregation and influenced black America concerning how to fight the inherently corrupt and oppressive system. The Montgomery bus boycott of 1955, the lunch counter sit-ins to desegregate restaurants in the South, the Freedom Rides of 1961, the fight to desegregate schools, the march from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama, the march on Washington, and many other events during the Civil Rights Movement were strongly influenced by the leadership of Keene, and every one of them displays the influence of his reflective thinking concerning Gandhi. Reflective thinking was a great tool in the hands of Martin Luther King, Jr., and it radically transformed American life. If you embrace it as King did, you may not be able to change the world, but you can certainly change your life. Here is a thinking question for you. Am I regularly revisiting the past to gain a true perspective and think with understanding? Putting reflective thinking into action. Create a daily reflection time to help you learn from the events of your day and to capture your ideas. Set aside a regular time and a place to do your reflecting. Practice the discipline of reflective thinking daily for 21 days. One of the most important things you can do is figure out what questions to ask yourself during your reflective thinking times. Begin by creating general questions to be used after any event or meeting. Then create more specific questions related to your values and relationships. At the end of this month, set aside a block of two to four hours to do a review of your calendar from the past month. Review your appointments. Check your to-do list. Figure out where you spent your time and whether you did it wisely. As you look at individual entries, ask yourself, what went right? What went wrong? What did I learn? What can I do differently next time? Don't forget to write down insights to be filed and action points to be completed. The next time you go to a conference, schedule an hour-long reflection time for a few days after the conference. When you attend the event, take good notes. Then when your scheduled reflection time rolls around, review your notes. For each good idea, either file it, share it with someone, or create an action point from it.
Chapter 11. Question the Acceptance of Popular Thinking. Up until December 18, 1998, I took my health almost for granted. I was 51 years old, my energy level was still very high, and I had never experienced any kind of medical problem. But on the night of my organization's Christmas party, I suffered a serious heart attack. Now I watch my diet. I exercise every day and I'm even more intentional in expressing my love to the important people in my life. It has also made me much more aware of issues related to health. That's how I came to read about Paul Ridker, a cardiologist who went against popular thinking and who is changing the way doctors think about patients' risk of heart attacks. Ridker became interested in medicine because as a child he suffered from a rare immune disorder. After receiving his undergraduate degree from Brown University, he went to Harvard Medical School where he received his medical degree and then went for a Master of Public Health degree. Today he is an Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and the Director of the Center for Cardiovascular Disease Prevention at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. In recent years, popular thinking among physicians said that the best predictor of potential heart attacks was the presence of high cholesterol in a patient's blood. But Ritger discovered that about half of all heart attacks occur in people with normal cholesterol levels. In fact, my cholesterol levels were in the normal range before I had my heart attack. Ritger's study indicated that inflammation of the arteries might be responsible, so he began a large-scale study to begin gathering data for his theory. What his research found was that a substance called C-reactive protein, CRP, is present in the blood of people with a high risk of suffering a heart attack. Tracking that substance is as reliable and inexpensive as checking cholesterol. And in fact, it's a better predictor of heart problems than elevated LDL, the bad cholesterol. Because he was willing to question popular thinking and go in another direction, fewer people are likely to die of heart disease in coming years. I've given you some broad reasons for questioning the acceptance of popular thinking. Now allow me to be more specific. Popular thinking sometimes means not thinking. Good thinking is hard work. If it were easy, everybody would be a good thinker. Unfortunately, many people don't want to do the hard work of thinking or pay the price of success. It's easier to just do what other people do and hope that they thought it out. For example, Look at the stock market recommendations of some experts. By the time they publish their picks, they are following a trend, not creating it or even writing its crest. Instead, it's old news. The people who are going to make money on the stocks they recommend have already done so by the time the general public hears about it. Anytime people are following a trend, they're not doing their own thinking. Popular thinking offers false hope. Many people look for safety and security in popular thinking. They figure that if a lot of people are doing something, then it must be right. If it's accepted by most people, then it probably represents fairness, equality, compassion, and sensitivity, right? Not necessarily. Popular thinking said the Earth was the center of the universe. Yet Copernicus studied the stars and planets and proved mathematically that the Earth and the other planets in our solar system revolved around the sun. Popular thinking said surgery didn't require clean instruments. Yet Joseph Lister studied the high death rates in hospitals and introduced antiseptic practices that immediately saved lives. Popular thinking said that women shouldn't have the right to vote. Yet people like Emmeline Pankhurst and Susan B. Anthony fought for and won that right. Popular thinking put the Nazis into power in Germany, but they murdered millions of people and nearly destroyed Europe. Many of the promises of popular thinking are hollow. Don't be fooled by them. Popular thinking is slow to embrace change. Popular thinking loves the status quo. It puts its confidence in the idea of the moment and holds on to it with all its might. As a result, it resists change and dampens innovation. A few years ago, I saw the movie October Sky. It's based on the true story of Homer Hickam, a boy who grew up in Colwood, a company-owned coal mining town in West Virginia. Everyone in the town, except perhaps the best athletes, seemed destined to work in the mines, and few people were willing to fight that common fate. However, Homer desired something different. Following the Soviet Union's launch of Sputnik, Homer wanted to build rockets and become an astronaut. 
Homer eventually fought his way out of Colwood, received his education from Virginia Tech, and became an engineer at NASA, training astronauts. He has since retired and works as a consultant to NASA, but he still hasn't given up his dream of going into space. If you desire to fight popular thinking as Homer Hickam did, then realize that it may be a slow process, but it is a worthwhile one. Popular thinking brings only average results. The bottom line is that popular thinking brings mediocre results. We limit our success when we adhere to popular thinking. It represents putting in the least energy to just get by. You must reject common thinking if you want to accomplish uncommon results. Popular thinking has often proved to be wrong and limiting. Questioning it isn't necessarily hard once you cultivate the habit of doing so. Begin by doing the following five things. Number one, think before you follow. Many people follow others almost automatically. Sometimes they do so because they desire to take the path of least resistance. Other times they fear rejection, or they believe that there's wisdom in doing what everyone else does. But if you want to succeed, you need to think about what's best, not what's popular. The next time you are ready to conform to popular thinking on an issue, stop and think. You may not want to create change for its own sake, but you don't want to blindly follow just because you haven't given an issue the time to think about what's best. Number two, appreciate thinking different from your own. One of the ways to embrace innovation and change is to learn to appreciate how others think. To do that, you must continually expose yourself to people who are different. As you strive to challenge popular thinking, spend time with people with different backgrounds, education levels, professional experiences, personal interests, etc. You will think like the people you spend the most time with. If you spend time with lots of people who think differently, you're more likely to challenge popular thinking and break new ground. Number three, continually question your own thinking. Any time we find a way of thinking that works, one of the greatest temptations is to go back to it over and over again, even if it no longer works well. That's why the greatest enemy to tomorrow's success is sometimes today's success. My friend Andy Stanley recently taught a leadership lesson at Enjoy's Catalyst Conference called Challenging the Process. In it, he described how progress must be preceded by change. His insights included the observations that in an organization, every tradition that was put into place was originally a good idea, and perhaps even revolutionary. Every tradition that was put into place may not be a good idea for the future. In your organization, if you were involved in the process of putting what currently exists into place, then it's likely that you will resist change, even change for the better. That's why it's important for you to challenge your own thinking. Number four, try new things in new ways. When was the last time you did something for the first time? Do you avoid taking risks or trying new things? One of the best ways to get out of the rut of your own thinking is to innovate. You can do that in little everyday ways. Drive to work a different way from the normal. Order a different dish at your favorite restaurant. Ask a different colleague to help you with a familiar project. Unpopular thinking asks questions and seeks options. How you go about doing new things in new ways is not as important as making sure that you do it. Get out there and do something different today. Number five, get used to being uncomfortable. When it comes right down to it, popular thinking is comfortable. It's like the old recliner in many people's homes that is adjusted to all of their idiosyncrasies. They've gotten used to it. But have you looked at that chair lately? For most people, it's time to get a new one. If you want to reject popular thinking in order to embrace achievement, you're going to need to get used to being uncomfortable. If you reject popular thinking and make decisions based upon what works best and what is right rather than what is accepted, know this. In your early years, you won't be as wrong as people think you are. In your later years, you won't be as right as people think you are. And all through the years, you will be better than you thought that you could be. Here's a thinking question for you. Am I consciously rejecting the limitations of common thinking in order to accomplish uncommon results? Putting unpopular thinking into action. Appreciate how other people think by getting into the head of an innovative thinker. 
Go to the bookstore or get on Amazon.com and browse biographies. Pick a book written about someone you ordinarily would not relate to or be attracted to. Take your mind where it doesn't ordinarily go and try to appreciate how the subject of the biography thought. Increase your ability to be uncomfortable. Do something every day in a way different than what you're used to. Drive to the office or grocery store a different way every day this week. Arrange your day in an order different from how you usually do. Go to a concert featuring music different from what you generally like. In other words, shake up your mind. We all have things in our lives that are overdue for change, ideas, processes, or objects that were great and revolutionary when they were new but really need to be changed now. Find something of that nature and change it. If you're having trouble discovering something in need of change, ask friends, a colleague, or your spouse to help you. Chapter 12. Encourage the Participation of Shared Thinking in early 2002, I was invited to meet and spend time with one of the greatest basketball coaches of all time, Pat Summit of the University of Tennessee. She's received more honors than any other coach except John Wooden. I had the chance to spend a few minutes with Pat in her office talking about leadership and teamwork. She said that each year of the thousand players who are coming out of high school to play college ball, eight or nine of them have what it takes to bring a team a championship. Every year, her goal is to recruit one of those players. Obviously, she's been very successful. There are a number of things that struck me about Pat. First, she's very warm, but extremely intense. She's known for her competitiveness. She says it comes in part from having a demanding father and three very competitive older brothers. Second, she's a leader through and through. She's very strategic in her communication with each player. She watches them and listens carefully to them to make sure they're tracking with her before she coaches them. Too many coaches, she says, try to give instruction to players when there's no foundation of understanding that has been established. But I'll tell you the thing that struck me the most about her. As strong as her personality and leadership ability are, she chooses to practice shared thinking. Let me give you an example. During halftime, she has the players interact together by themselves and do their own review and diagnosis of how the game is going. They share their observations and solutions with one another without any coach's input. She's very strategic about cultivating this ability in them. She engages a psychologist to teach her players how to interact productively without the involvement of coaches. While the players are talking, Pat meets with her coaches to hear their observations. After about ten minutes, she, the coaches, and the players all get together. The players review their findings and planned corrections for Pat and she and the other coaches make corrections to their plans if needed. It's a model of shared thinking. Good thinkers, especially those who are also good leaders like Pat Summit, understand the power of shared thinking. They know that when they value the thoughts and ideas of others, they receive the compounding results of shared thinking and accomplish more than they ever could on their own. People who participate in shared thinking understand the following. Shared thinking is faster than solo thinking. Working with others is like giving yourself a shortcut. You can always learn more quickly when you have the help of someone with experience. Whether you are trying to learn how to use a new software package, develop your golf swing, or cook a new dish in the kitchen. Shared thinking is more innovative than solo thinking. Shared thinking leads to greater innovation whether you are looking at the work of researchers Marie and Pierre Curie, or songwriters such as John Lennon and Paul McCartney. If you combine the thoughts you have and the thoughts that others have, you will come up with thoughts that you never had. Shared thinking brings more maturity than solo thinking. As much as we would like to think that we know it all, each of us is probably painfully aware of our blind spots and areas of inexperience. When I first started out as a pastor, I had little experience. To try to overcome that, I attempted to get several high-profile pastors of growing churches to share their thinking with me. When one said yes, I'd go to visit him. I didn't talk much except to ask a few questions. I was there to learn. I listened to everything he said, took careful notes, and absorbed everything I could. The bottom line is that you've had experiences I haven't, and I've had experiences that you haven't. Put us together and we bring a broader range of personal history, and therefore maturity, to the table. 
Shared thinking is stronger than solo thinking. Two heads are better than one when they are thinking in the same direction. It's like harnessing two horses together to pull a wagon. As you might guess, pulling together, they are stronger than each is individually. But did you know that when they pull together, the weight they can move is more than the sum of what they can do individually? There's a synergy that comes from working together. That same kind of energy comes into play when people are thinking together. Shared thinking returns greater value than solo thinking. Because shared thinking is stronger, it's obvious that it yields a higher return. That happens because of the compounding action of shared thinking. But it also offers other benefits. The personal return you receive from shared thinking and experiences can be great. Shared thinking is the only way to have great thinking. I believe that every great idea begins with three or four good ideas. And most good ideas come from shared thinking. A great thought is seldom birthed from a good thought. Usually great thoughts are the result of several good thoughts. If we each have one thought and together we have two thoughts, then we always have the potential for a great thought. Some people are naturally good at participating in shared thinking. Anytime they see a problem, their first thought is, who are the people I know who can help with this? Use the following five steps to help you improve your ability to harness shared thinking in your life. Number one, value the ideas of others. The first key to shared thinking is believing that the ideas of other people have value. How do you know if you truly want input from others? Ask yourself these questions. Am I emotionally secure? People who lack confidence and are worried about their status, position, or power tend to reject the ideas of others, protect their turf, and keep people at bay. It takes a secure person to be open to others' ideas. Do I place value on people? You won't value the ideas of a person if you don't value and respect the person himself. Have you ever considered your conduct around people you value versus those you don't? Look at the differences. If I value people, I want to spend time with them. I listen to them. I want to help them. I am influenced by them. I respect them. If I don't value people, I don't want to be around them. I neglect to listen. I don't offer them help. I ignore them. I am indifferent. Do I value the interactive process? For many years, my tendency was to withdraw when I wanted to develop ideas. I was reluctant to work on ideas with others. When a colleague challenged me on this, I started to analyze why I was so hesitant. I realized that it went back to my college experience. There were days in the classroom when I could tell a teacher was unprepared to lecture and instead spent the class time asking us students to give our uninformed opinions on a subject. Most of the time, students' opinions were no better than mine. I had come to class so that the professor could teach me. Shared thinking is only as good as the people doing the sharing. Since learning that lesson, I have embraced the interactive process, and now I believe it's one of my strengths. However, I am always thoughtful about who I bring around the table for a shared thinking session. Number two, move from competition to cooperation. A person who values cooperation desires to complete the ideas of others, not compete with them. If you are asked to engage in the sharing of ideas, put your focus on helping the team, not getting ahead personally. And if you are the one who brings people together to share their thoughts, praise the idea more than the source of the idea. If the best idea always wins rather than the person who offered it, then everyone will be willing to share their thoughts with greater enthusiasm. Number three, have an agenda when you meet. When I'm meeting with someone I'm mentoring, I let the person ask the questions, but I expect to do most of the talking. When I meet with someone who mentors me, I mostly keep my mouth shut. In other relationships, the give and take is more even, but no matter who I'm meeting with, I have a reason for getting together with a person or people, and I have an expectation for what I'll get out of it. Number four, get the right people around the table. The greatest secret to winning shared thinking is having the right people around the table. To get anything of value out of shared thinking, you need to have people around the table who bring something to the table. As you prepare to bring people into a situation where they will be asked to participate in shared thinking, 
use the following criteria for the selection process. Choose people whose greatest desire is the success of the ideas. People who can add value to another person's thoughts. Choose people who can emotionally handle quick changes in the conversation. And people who appreciate the strengths of others in areas where they are weak. Choose people who understand their place of value at the table. And people who place what is best for the team before themselves. Choose people who can bring out the best thinking in the people around them and choose people who possess maturity, experience, and success in the issue being discussed. People should be chosen who take ownership and responsibility for the decisions that are made. And finally, choose people who will leave the table with a we attitude, not a me attitude. Number five, compensate good thinkers and collaborators well. Successful organizations practice shared thinking. If you lead an organization, department, or team, then you can't afford to be without people who are good at shared thinking. As you recruit and hire people, look for good thinkers who value others, have experience with the collaborative process, and are emotionally secure. Then pay them well and challenge them to use their thinking skills and share them often. Here's a thinking question for you. Am I consistently including the heads of others to think over my head and achieve compounding results? Putting shared thinking into action. How are you when it comes to shared thinking? Are you naturally likely or unlikely to include other people in the thinking process when you face a difficult challenge or troublesome problem? Rate yourself on a scale of 1 to 10, with 1 indicating that you never include others and a 10 indicating that you nearly always invite others to share ideas with you. If you gave yourself anything lower than a 7, then you need to do some soul searching. Figure out why you have been reluctant to include others in the process. Is it that you don't place a high value on people? Or you don't value the interactive thinking process? Or maybe you are not a very secure person. Or is there another reason? Pursue changes that will help you address this issue. If you don't already have one, create a list of good thinkers and their areas of expertise. Then the next time you have a worthwhile problem to solve or task to tackle, look over your list and bring together people who can add value according to the criteria given in the chapter on who should be brought to the table. Finally, review your calendar for the coming week. Examine every appointment or activity you have listed and think about the agenda for each. Take some time to clarify what you want to get out of an interaction with each person or what you expect to give to him or her. Write down questions or ideas in your planner or on an index card if necessary. Then, when you meet, make sure to touch on your agenda items during your time. Afterward, jot down any ideas that may come as a result. You may be surprised by how much more productive your time will become. Chapter 13. Experience the Satisfaction of Unselfish Thinking In 1885, a young man named George used every penny he had to travel to Highland, Kansas. He was excited because he had been granted admission to Highland College. As a youngster, he and his brother had walked nine miles each way to school in order to start their education. At age 12, he had left home for good to attend high school, having supported himself doing chores and housework. At age 20, he was ready to start college. However, when he got to Highland College, when school officials discovered that he was black, they turned him away. In 1890, he once again attempted to enroll in school. This time, he was accepted by Simpson College. He opened a laundry to support himself, and he studied painting and piano. George excelled in the arts. One of his works was awarded a first prize at the 1893 World's Fair in Chicago. He wrote poetry and saw it published in newspapers. He was musically talented. In 1891, when he transferred to Iowa State College, he continued working in the arts, but he also pursued other interests. He became a trainer for the athletic teams. He joined the campus's military regiment, where he rose to the group's highest rank of captain and he led the YMCA and the debate club. But George changed his major from art to agriculture. Why would he do such a thing, especially when he loved art so much? 
George summed up the change in his studies simply by saying, Art would not do my people as much good. George Washington Carver went on to receive his degree in agriculture from Iowa State. His excellence in the fields of botany and horticulture prompted two professors to encourage him to stay on as a graduate student and earn his master's degree. He did. And in the process, he worked as the assistant botanist for the College Experiment Station, developed expertise in plant pathology and mycology, and became the first African-American faculty member at Iowa State College. In April of 1896, Carver received an unusual offer from Dr. Booker T. Washington of the Tuskegee Institute. It was to take a teaching position there and become the school's director of agriculture. Carver could have lived a comfortable life in Iowa. He was respected professionally, he was an accepted member of the community, and he had built relationships there. Yet all of these things he now gave up to move to Alabama in the heart of the Deep South, where he would be regarded as a second-class citizen. And he did it because he was a practitioner of unselfish thinking, who wanted to help people who were in more difficult circumstances than himself. The irony of unselfish thinking is that, in the end, its return can often be greater than that of any other kind of thinking. Listen to some of its benefits. Unselfish thinking brings personal fulfillment. Few things in life are as personally rewarding as helping other people. When you spend your day unselfishly serving others, at night you can lay your head down with no regrets and sleep soundly. Even if you have spent much of your life in pursuit of selfish gain, it's never too late to have a change of heart and finish differently. That's what Alfred Nobel did. When he saw his own obituary in the newspaper, his brother had died and the editor had mistakenly published a retrospective of the wrong Nobel, saying that the explosives his company produced had killed many people. Nobel vowed to promote peace and acknowledge contributions to humanity. That is how the Nobel Prizes came into being. Unselfish thinking adds value to others. In 1904, Bessie Anderson Stanley wrote the following definition of success in Brown Book magazine. He has achieved success who has lived well, laughed often, and loved much, who has enjoyed the trust of pure women, the respect of intelligent men, and the love of little children, who has filled his niche and accomplished his task, who has left the world better than he found it, whether by an improved poppy, a perfect poem, or a rescued soul who has never lacked appreciation of earth's beauties or failed to express it, who has always looked for the best in others and given them the best he had, whose life was an inspiration, whose memory a benediction. When you get outside of yourself and make a contribution to others, you really begin to live. Unselfish thinking encourages other virtues. Of all the qualities a person can pursue, Unselfish thinking seems to make the biggest difference toward cultivating other virtues. I think that's because the ability to give unselfishly is so difficult. It goes against the grain of human nature. But if you can learn to think unselfishly and become a giver, then it becomes easier to develop many other virtues. Gratitude, love, respect, patience, discipline, etc. Unselfish thinking increases quality of life. When people attain a spirit of generosity created by unselfish thinking, it gives them an appreciation for life and an understanding of the higher values of life. Seeing people in need and giving to meet that need puts a lot of things into perspective. Unselfish thinking makes you part of something greater than yourself. Merck and Company, the global pharmaceutical corporation, has always seen itself as doing more than just producing products and making a profit. They desire to serve humanity. In the mid-1980s, the company developed a drug to cure river blindness, a disease that infects and causes blindness in millions of people, particularly in developing countries. The problem was that the potential customers couldn't afford to buy it. Merck developed the drug anyway, and in 1987 announced that they would give it free to anyone who needed it. As of 1998, they had given more than 250 million tablets away. Unselfish thinking creates a legacy. If you are successful, it becomes possible for you to leave an inheritance for others. But if you desire to do more, to create a legacy, then you need to leave that in others. 
When you think unselfishly and invest in others, you gain the opportunity to create a legacy that will outlive you. To begin cultivating the ability to think unselfishly, I recommend that you do the following five things. First, put others first. The process begins with realizing that everything is not about you. That requires humility and a shift in focus. If you want to become less selfish in your thinking, then you need to stop thinking about your wants and begin focusing on others' needs. Make a mental and emotional commitment to look out for the interest of others. Second, expose yourself to situations where people have needs. It's one thing to believe you are willing to give unselfishly. It's another to actually do it. To make the transition, you need to put yourself in a position where you can see people's needs and do something about it. Number three, give quietly or anonymously. Once you have learned to give of yourself, then the next step is to learn to give when you cannot receive anything in return. There are spiritual, mental, and emotional benefits that come only to those who give anonymously. If you've never done it before, try it. Number four. Invest in people intentionally. The highest level of unselfish thinking comes when you give of yourself to another person for their personal development or well-being. If you're married or a parent, you know this from personal experience. What does your spouse value most highly? Money in the bank or your time freely given? What would small children rather have from you? A toy or your undivided attention? The people who love you would rather have you than what you can give them. Number five, continually check your motives. The hardest thing for most people related to unselfish thinking is fighting their natural tendency to put themselves first. That's why it's important to continually examine your motives to make sure that you're not sliding backwards into selfishness. One of the things that you can do to check your motives is to follow the modeling of Benjamin Franklin. Every day he asked himself two questions. When he got up in the morning, he would ask, what good am I going to do today? And before he went to bed, he would ask, What good have I done today? If you can answer those questions with selflessness and integrity, you can keep yourself on track. Here's a thinking question for you. Am I continually considering others and their journey in order to think with maximum collaboration? Putting unselfish thinking into action. One of the things you can do to put others first and to develop and maintain unselfish motives is to set unselfish goals for yourself. For example, think about some things that you could do to help others that will in no way benefit you other than to give you internal satisfaction. Set an amount of money to give away this year, anonymously if possible. Decide on a number of hours a week or a month to serve others or find a ministry or cause that you believe in that you will help to succeed. Many times the most rewarding acts of unselfishness come when you obey an inner sense to meet a need. During the coming week, tune your intuitive radar to look for needs among people. When you perceive a need and feel prompted to help, follow through on that inclination. An investment in a person ultimately pays the highest return because it can result in changed lives. Think about what you have to invest in another person. What skills do you possess that someone would benefit from learning? What life experiences have you had that can help another person? What resources do you possess that ought to be shared? Once you have figured out what you have to give, then look for someone with need and potential who would be glad to receive it and invest in that person. The next time you put together a deal or develop a professional relationship, think in terms of win-win. If both you and the other person would not benefit, then don't go through with the deal. And once you've determined that it will be good for both of you, make the effort to guarantee that the other person wins first. Chapter 14. Enjoy the Return of Bottom Line Thinking How do you figure out the bottom line when it comes to your organization, business department, team, or group? In many businesses, profit is what determines whether you are succeeding. But dollars should not always be the primary measure of success. For example, you certainly wouldn't measure the ultimate success of your family by how much money you had at the end of the month or year, would you? And if you run a non-profit or volunteer organization, how do you think bottom line in that situation? 
That's a question Frances Hesselbein had to ask herself in 1976 when she became the National Executive Director of the Girl Scouts of America. In the early 1950s, she was recruited as a volunteer troop leader at the Second Presbyterian Church in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Even that was in itself rather unusual since she had a son and no daughters, but she agreed to do it on a temporary basis. She must have loved it because she led the troop for nine years. In time, she became council president and a member of the national board. Then she was made executive director of the Talis Rock Girl Scout Council, a full-time paid position. By the time she took the job as CEO of the organization, it was in trouble. The Girl Scouts lacked direction. On top of that, teenage girls were losing interest in the organization, and it was becoming increasingly difficult to recruit adult volunteers, especially with greater numbers of women entering into the workforce. We kept asking ourselves very simple questions, she said. What is our business? Who is our customer? And what does the customer consider valuable? If you're the Girl Scouts, IBM, or AT&T, you have to manage for a mission. Frances's focus on mission enabled her to figure out what the Girl Scouts' bottom line truly was. We really are here for one reason, to help a girl reach her highest potential. More than any one thing that made the difference. Because when you are clear about your mission, corporate goals and operating objectives flow from it. Once she figured out what her bottom line was, she was able to create a strategy to try to achieve it. She started by reorganizing the national staff. Then she created a planning system that would be used by each of the 350 regional councils. And she introduced management training to the organization. The organization made the activities more relevant to the current culture giving greater opportunities for use of computers, for example, rather than hosting a party. She also sought out minority participation, created bilingual materials, and reached out to low-income areas. If helping girls reach their highest potential was their bottom line, then why not be more aggressive helping girls who traditionally had fewer opportunities to have someone invest in them? The strategy worked beautifully. Minority participation in the Girl Scouts tripled. In 1990, Frances left the Girl Scouts, having made it a first-class organization. She went on to become the founding president and CEO of the Peter F. Drucker Foundation for Nonprofit Management and now serves as chairman of its Board of Governors. And in 1998, she was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom. As you explore the concept of bottom-line thinking, recognize that it can help you in many ways. Bottom line thinking provides great clarity. What's the difference between bowling and work? In bowling, it takes only three seconds to know how you've done. That's one of the reasons people love sports so much. There's no waiting and no guessing about the outcome. Bottom line thinking makes it possible for you to measure outcomes more quickly and easily. It gives you a benchmark to measure activity by. It can be used as a focused way of ensuring that all your little activities are purposeful and line up towards achieving a larger goal. Bottom line thinking helps you assess every situation. When you know what your bottom line is, then it becomes much easier to know how you're doing in any given area. There's no better measurement tool than the bottom line. Bottom line thinking helps you make the best decisions. Similarly, Decisions also become much easier when you know your bottom line. When the Girl Scouts were struggling in the 1970s, outside organizations approached them to try to convince them to become women's rights activists or door-to-door -door canvassers. But under Francis, it was easy for the Girl Scouts to say no. They knew what their bottom line was, and they wanted to pursue it with focus and fervency. Bottom line thinking generates high morale. When you know what the bottom line is and you go after it, you greatly increase your odds of winning. And nothing generates high morale like winning. Hitting the target is always exhilarating. And you can hit it only if you know what it is. Bottom line thinking ensures your future. If you want to be successful tomorrow, then you need to think bottom line today. Look at any successful, lasting company and you'll find leaders who know their bottom line and they make their decisions, allocate their resources, hire their people, and structure their organizations to achieve it. Seeing the value of the bottom line isn't difficult. Most people would agree that bottom line thinking has a high return. Learning how to be a bottom line thinker can be more challenging. Utilize the following five steps to help you improve your ability to harness bottom line thinking in your life. 
Number one, identify the real bottom line. The process of bottom line thinking begins with knowing what you're really going after. It can be as lofty as the big picture vision, mission, or purpose of an organization. Or it can be as focused as what you want to accomplish on a particular project. What's important is that you be as specific as possible. If your goal is for something as vague as success, you will have a painfully difficult time trying to harness bottom line thinking to achieve it. The first step is to set aside your wants. What you really need to do is get to the results you're really looking for, the true essence of the goal. When it comes right down to it, what are you really trying to achieve? What must occur? What is acceptable? That is really the bottom line. Number two, make the bottom line the point. Have you ever been in a conversation with someone and although he's stating that his intentions are one thing, you know that he has another agenda? Sometimes that kind of situation can be the result of intentional deception. However, I believe it also occurs sometimes when the person is unaware of his own bottom line. The same kind of thing happens in companies. For example, sometimes an idealistically stated mission and the real bottom line aren't one and the same. Purpose and profits compete with each other. Number three, create a strategic plan to achieve the bottom line. One of the greatest values of bottom line thinking is that it achieves results. Therefore, it naturally follows that any plans that flow out of that kind of thinking must tie directly back to the bottom line. Once it is determined what that is, a strategy must be created to achieve it. In organizations, that often means identifying the core elements or functions that must operate properly to achieve the bottom line. This is the leader's responsibility. The important thing is that when the bottom line of each activity is achieved, then the bottom line is achieved. If the sum of the smaller goals don't add up to achieve the real bottom line, then either your strategy is flawed or you've not identified your real bottom line. Number four, align team members with the bottom line. Once you have your strategy in place, you need to make sure your people line up with your strategy. Ideally, not only should all the people on the team know the big goal, but they should also know what their individual role is in achieving it. Number five, stick with one system and monitor results continually. When I was talking to Dave Sutherland about bottom line thinking, he told me that one of the ways organizations get into trouble is they try to mix systems. He believes that many different kinds of systems can be successful, but mixing different systems or continually changing from one to another leads to failure. When it comes right down to it, no matter what your bottom line is, you can improve it with good thinking. And bottom line thinking has a great return because it helps you to turn your ideas into results. Like no other kind of mental processing, it can help you to reap the full potential of your thinking and achieve whatever you desire to do. Here's a thinking question for you. Am I staying focused on the bottom line so that I can gain the maximum return and reap the full potential of my thinking? Putting bottom line thinking into action. How much have you thought about your own bottom line? Do you know why you're doing what you're doing in your career? Have you figured out what you're trying to accomplish in your family life? If someone asks, would you be able to tell him for what purpose you've been put on this earth? Your life can be more fulfilling and your thinking can be more fruitful if you know your purpose. Give some thought to each of the following six areas to determine what your bottom line is for each. Career, marriage, parenting, recreation, service or ministry, and life purpose. Don't feel bad if you don't have perfect clarity on all of these issues. It takes most people years to figure it all out. This exercise is merely a starting point. Choose a major goal in your life or career that you strongly desire to achieve. Take time to write that goal down. Then, set aside a block of time this week to determine what the bottom line is for this goal. Remember to make sure that the bottom line is the point, not a substitute for another unstated goal or just a step toward it. Once you've figured out what the bottom line is, write it down also. Your next step is to develop a strategy for accomplishing the bottom line. What are the core elements required to achieve it? What are the major objectives? Break it down to the most fundamental parts. 
Now determine what kind of help will be required to achieve the goal. Can you do it alone? Will it require the aid of friends or colleagues? Will you need to start your own organization to do it? Is there an organization that already exists that you can join to accomplish it? Your next step will be to align the people with the strategy for achieving the bottom line. Then you will be ready to move forward. I hope you've enjoyed our journey together through the kinds of thinking that make people successful. And I hope you have learned more about yourself and how you think. Your thinking, more than anything else, shapes the way you live. It's really true that if you change your thinking, you can change your life. This has been a Time Warner Audiobooks production of Thinking for a Change. 11 Ways Highly Successful People Approach Life and Work. Written and read by John C. Maxwell. Executive Producer, Maya Thomas. Produced and directed by Lewis Milgram. Text abridged by Jessica Kay. Production supervised by Dennis Kale. Thinking for a Change is also available in hardcover from Warner Books. To listen to samples, read more about the authors, learn about digital audio, and buy digital audio books, please visit Time Warner Audio Books websites at www.twbookmark.com and www.mytimewarneraudio.com. <laughs>